Okay, so members, you're very welcome this afternoon to the committee executive office committee for our first meeting after the Easter break. I hope that everybody's well refreshed after having a little bit of time off and uh, everybody's welcome back to the committee this afternoon. Um, I am in, well, don't need to be informed that there are no apologies because everybody is here, so everybody's very welcome uh, for the meeting. Uh, in terms of Chairman's business, maybe just on behalf of the committee to acknowledge the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh, which took place at the weekend. On uh, Saturday as well, and just to extend condolences to his family at this time. And also uh, to, as well, maybe just acknowledge that there has been considerable um, unrest on the streets uh, over the Easter period as well. That's always something that is unwelcome, something that we don't want to see. It harks back the day, to days that we, we thought that we had moved away from. Uh, and certainly I know that uh, the last uh, couple of nights have been a bit quieter and I hope that calm heads can prevail and that those that have influence within their communities will use that influence uh, to be able to ensure that we do uh, have peace on the streets and uh, also just that all of us as politicians will use uh, our uh, ability to be able uh, to send a message that, that we want to see peace on our streets and that we don't want to see any of the violence that we have seen in the last number of uh, days. So moving on then, we'll go to item three, which is the draft minutes. Uh, and they are of a meeting that was held on the 24th of March on page six. Are members content that they're a true reflection of the meeting? Content. Okay, that's good. People are content. We can get that uh, signed up. Yep. Um, then we move on to item four for matters arising. Um, we have... Um, Page. Sorry, oh, it's Doug. That's sorry. Maybe Doug will put himself on to. Oh, there we go. You were that conversation within the starlight there. So it was Doug. <laughs> yeah, there we go. We're sorted. So item four then matters arising uh, on page sixteen of the meeting pack. There was correspondence from the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse providing the committee with revised figures on the number of applications made to the redress board. And that was just addressing a previous uh, presentation that was made, just, just rectifying a figure. And then on page 25 of the meeting pack, uh, there is the correspondence from the Rosetta Trust, which is registering the concerns in relation to the operation of the redress scheme and requesting a meeting with the chair and deputy chair. Now that, that meeting uh, is scheduled and, and is in process of, of being scheduled rather, <clears throat> uh, we did ask for the inclusion and it is in the meeting pack of those two sets of information, uh, what the commissioner was saying that was being dealt with and the issues that were being uh, raised by the various groups but we will certainly undertake to go and have a conversation based on the, those two lists and, and hopefully that will help to provide a conduit for that information to be relayed. Are members happy enough with that information that's contained? Yeah, uh, Martina, yeah. Yeah, there, um, I find it disturbing reading some of the details, particularly that the victims are feeling that um, going through the redress board is re-traumatizing them. Mm -hmm. and they're having to recount um, a lot of memories and they find it very disturbing. Now, we have been given such information before in relation to this process and I do think we need to try our best as a committee to do what we can to see if there's a resolution. I appreciate the fact that you're having the meeting, uh, yourself and, and the vice chair, uh, but I am getting increasingly concerned now about a continuous flow of information from victims in relation to their experience and it's not a good one and that was not what this was supposed to be. So as someone who was involved in the historical institution abuse inquiry at the beginning of the process many years ago, um, certainly I think that none of us as MLA would want to see the victims going through what they are expressing to us and we cannot ignore it. So there needs to be a resolution of something found to resolve this issue. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose we're, we're, well, the purpose of that document with the two sort of columns is because um, making sure that in terms of the timeline, because I think that some of the issues that may have been raised with us were also raised with Missioner. So it's maybe about saying, has the Commissioner taken the opportunity to address those issues? And that's what I think would be very useful in the meeting with the myself and the Deputy Chair is to determine how many of those issues have been heard, have been listened to. And hopefully what we want to hear is that there's been some action on that for people. Um, was there anybody else looking in on that? Yes, Chair. Uh, just to say that I agree with uh, what Martina Anderson has just said. Um, this process has taken a long time to put in place. Uh, there's been a long, hard march for the victims. And I don't want this to be failing at the last when it comes to the actual delivery uh, for people. And like uh, Martina and I'm sure other members of this committee, I have received correspondence from victims describing um, in uh, stark terms the, I don't want to say brutality, but the uh, emotional distress that has been caused going through this process. So uh, I think any steps that we as a committee can take, either to highlight it with the department or certainly to highlight it uh, with the commissioner is, is really important because uh, it's vital that the, the redress program is delivered in a way that doesn't further hurt people. So, no, I want to associate myself with what um, Mrs. Anderson has said because I think it's absolutely right. Well, I absolutely think it would be a service that's failing if it's re-traumatising people. That, that absolutely is not, there's no purpose or point to that. So I think we need to satisfy ourselves um, that there is steps are being taken to make sure that there is no re-traumatisation of people uh, as they go through the process. So definitely, it's, and it's good to hear that we have and um, you know the cross-party support of the committee uh, to be able to, to go in and have those conversations. So myself and Doug, the, the deputy chair, will will take those and have those conversations with the group. I'm also going to suggest as well maybe that we take an oral briefing uh, from the victim and survivor service just to ascertain how they are engaging as well um, with those uh, in the process. And also maybe if we get some update from the departmental officials about the support that is available uh, in terms of welfare and other for those. And, and maybe that if those two go together, we might get a, a committee meeting that could lend itself to just having another look at this situation to make sure that it's been carried out properly. So would members be in agreement with that? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay. Um, Members, then we will move then to item five, which is the uh, oral briefing from the First and Deputy First Minister, which is on page 29 to 62 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers. And um, if the uh, broadcasting could bring the First and Deputy First Minister up into the uh, spotlight with us as well. And they can see one, can see the other. Yes. Oh, right. Or else is. Second time, we'll just get this transferred across. So, uh, First and Deputy First Minister, you're very welcome to the committee meeting this afternoon. It's good to have you along uh, to get an update on the department and the work of the department and the priorities at the moment. Um, as ever, we'll maybe uh, lend over to yourselves to give uh, some opening remarks and then we'll move to questions after that. Sorry, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, as with the last time, Chair, I think we'll just give brief opening remarks uh, in an alternative fashion because we know that colleagues will want to ask uh, a number of questions. Um, first of all, it's good to be back with you since we last met, and I think it was January uh, of this year. I'm pleased to say that since that appearance, we are in a much more optimistic position in our fight against COVID-19. The successful rollout of the vaccine programme has been uh, amazing. We've seen over 750,000 people receive their first vaccination and appointments are now being offered to those aged uh, over 40. Uh, the achievement is, of course, testament to the outstanding efforts of people right across our health service, including all of our volunteers who have manned many of the, the COVID stations. Uh, and whilst, of course, that's welcome news, it's important to emphasise that the programme does remain dependent on vaccine production, supply and distribution. And we will continue to fully support the Health Minister in his efforts to ensure appropriate allocations are coming into Northern Ireland. A number of other areas that the department has been focused on since January um, that we're going to highlight. And then if there are others that you wish to, to speak to, we're happy to take those as well. 
uh, EU exit matters, uh, departmental financial position for 21-22, uh, victims and survivors, and uh, the programme for government. So I'll hand over to Michelle. Thanks, Arlene. Thanks, Chair. And again, welcome the opportunity to, to be in front of the committee again today and to discuss anything that's current um, in terms of the work of the department. Um, COVID obviously remains our priority and our response to the pandemic continues to be led by the latest scientific and medical advice. Um, the executive's focus is on building a careful and ambitious longer term plan for moving forward in 2021 and, and obviously and beyond. Um, Chair, you'll know that the executive will meet tomorrow when we're going to be reviewing the potential for easing of restrictions. And a number of proposals have been received and these will be considered alongside um, the advice provi provided by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. And I'm sure that um, committee members might want to talk a wee bit more about that um, today without us preempting the executive. But I think that, as Arlene has said, there's a number of areas that we want to update you um, on today. And we're happy to respond to members' queries, views and uh, and issues which she wished to raise. So back, darling. Okay, and uh, in terms of EU exit matters, Chair, you will be aware that the challenges that our businesses have faced since the end of the transition period continue. Uh, at the beginning of January, when we were last in front of the committee, we advised that businesses had been experiencing disruption. Um, this was in part due to the lack of readiness amongst businesses in England, Scotland and Wales that trade with us, as well, of course, as the impact of COVID-19 at that time. And since the end of the transition period, we've continued to work closely uh, with HMG and other devolved administrations at both ministerial and official level to deal with the ongoing issues. Back to Michelle. Thanks. Um, so as an executive, we're regularly um, keeping under review the ongoing issues related to the end of the transition period, including the business readiness issues, SPS, VAT and cost end of the grace periods. The committee will be aware um, of the easements which were unilaterally extended by the British government last month. And I think it's important to learn from previous experience and to ensure that these extensions are uh, now being brought about are used well so that both systems and businesses here and in Britain are ready by the extended um, deadlines. So we're going to continue to monitor the ongoing discussions with the EU, including the legal action recently initiated by the EU. And I, I just saw some commentary in the media around that before we started this meeting this afternoon. Um, the EU has requested in correspondence to um, do it for us on the 15th of March and at a specialised committee meeting on the 26th of March, a credible roadmap with clear milestones stones for implementation. And we understand that both the British government, um, or that the British government provided the EU with that roadmap on the 31st of March. So I think there's an ongoing piece of work Arnie. Okay, uh, then in terms of victims and survivors issues uh, in relation to the appointment of the commissioner, uh, our officials have prepared the comprehensive documentation required to begin the recruitment process to appoint a new commissioner for victims and survivors. And we're currently looking at that and hope to progress to the next stage of the recruitment exercise as soon as possible. But in the meantime, we recognize that continuity is very important for victims and survivors. So we've ensured that interim arrangements are in place within the commission to allow the provision of continued support uh, for victims and survivors. Of course, the service um, will also continue to deliver its services, um, which are, of course, tailored to meet individual needs. Yeah. And then just on the victims payment scheme um, for permanent disabil or disablement, um, as members will be aware, the Court of Appeal has been very clear that the Executive Office has a legal duty to fund victims payments and an undertaking was provided by TEO and accepted by the court on Monday of this week. It confirms that payments will be made to successful applicants under the scheme and we remain committed to delivering the scheme and are mindful of the needs of victims and survivors who will be the recipient of the payment. So this undertaking itself provides reassurance and confidence that payment uh, will uh, be made when they fall due under the terms of the scheme regardless of where the funding comes from. But alongside with the uh, Justice Minister, the Finance Minister, we met last week with uh, Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State, to discuss the ongoing funding issue and we made it very clear at that meeting that the offer of financial support, which she has proposed, falls considerably short of what is um, required. We will continue to progress financial discussions with the Secretary of State and the NIO in the context of their 
fund responsibilities for the scheme as set out in the statement of funding policy. So we move on then to our financial position in the office. Uh, members will be familiar with the challenging budget from uh, which the executive has had to operate and have received a briefing from our officials on the specific challenges facing the office. Uh, for the record, our final budget allocation for 21-22 provides resource Dell of 120.5 million and capital Dell of just 15.3 million. We have uh, been provided with 46.2 million for the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Scheme. That's going to allow the department to meet compensation uh, levels, which the Redress Board is expecting us to pay, as well as other associated costs flowing from the HIA inquiry. We have also secured 6.7 million for victims' payments to fund implementation costs. And of course, there remains a funding shortfall of some 19 million, as estimated, in relation to forecast legal obligations of payments to victims for 21-22, which, as the DFM has highlighted, remains subject to ongoing negotiations uh, with Her Majesty's Government. And also alongside that, the Department has identified an anticipated COVID-19 uh, cost of about £5.8 million for next year. Um, we've received an allocation of 2.1, so we'll need to keep that under review to ensure that our, our own COVID-19 recovery requirements are met. In terms of shared future funding, you'll be aware that the draft budget didn't provide replacement funding. However, we're glad to say that the final budget does provide the full £12 million that is estimated as required for this year. This is obviously very welcome and will ensure a continued delivery of um, what is a major programme. Our capital budget of £15.3 million will also enable us to meet our current baseline capital requirements. And we will continue to closely monitor the overall capital position as part of any future monitoring rounds. Then finally, uh, Chair, in relation to the programme for government, um, at our last meeting, uh, or sorry, at your last meeting, the committee received a briefing from officials on the development of our outcomes-based um, strategic PFG. We've had an extensive and inclusive public consultation to ensure that the new programme for government meets the needs and, uh, more importantly, the expectations of citizens and stakeholders. The executive has been clear and unequivocal in its commitment to delivering an outcomes-based programme that has widespread support. And as you will have heard from officials, this consultation is now being analysed and that's going to inform and influence our decision making. And as we've said before, our response to COVID-19 uh, demonstrated very clearly the importance of a whole of government uh, approach when it comes to public service planning and delivery. So partnership working, co-design are very central to an outcomes-based approach and for it to be a success, we need to ensure that there's buy-in from every sector. And in the immediate period, the executive has positioned a COVID-19 recovery strategy at the centre of a three-step strategic pro um, process involving a pathway of restrictions, recovery and renewal and then a green programme for government. The aim is to develop the cross-departmental plan, which has an immediate focus on societal, economic and health recovery, taking account of prevailing COVID-19 restrictions. This will be followed by PFG action plans to deliver desired change and improvement towards achieving long-term programme for government outcomes. So looking ahead, it's intended that the new PFG will be maintained in a live format, with work plans being continually evaluated and adjusted to ensure they're achieving the desired impact. So certainly a new way of working, but it makes it in a real life format. I think that's us from us for by way of introduction, Chair. That's us, Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ministers, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's been a useful summary, and, and indeed, it is certainly a confirmation of much of the presentations that we've had from various officers within the department over the past period as well. So it's good to get it in summary form. Um, in terms of opening up for a few questions, I, I do want to take a reflection um, just on some of the uh, violence that we've seen on the street in the past week uh, with so many police officers injured and so much destruction uh, in certain parts of the community. I think it's important just to, to get some commitments and some understanding of what happened and moving forward. And also, maybe if I could start with yourself, First Minister, um, this day last week, you we were on Twitter uh, and referred to the attack uh, on a journalist as um, being done by bullies. And then in another tweet, you referred to the real lawbreakers in Sinn Féin. And I'm just wondering if you could clarify that for us, because 
There were those that were committing hate crimes. There were those that were attempting murder by throwing petrol bombs at bus drivers and people that were attacking the police and vandalising properties. Were they not really breaking the law? And do you think that such comments may have given licence to those that were rioting on the streets? Sorry, uh, Chair, my mute keeps coming on and off. Uh, well, first of all, absolutely not. Um, nobody can take anything that I have said as given license to do anything. Uh, the point I was making in relation to the tweet, however clumsily it was worded, was that ab initio, in other words, from the beginning, the law breaking uh, back in June uh, the 30th was from June. <clears throat> that was the point I was making. Of course, people who riot, people who injure police officers, people who destroy their own communities, are breaking the law. That's very clear for everybody to see. And the point is, uh, from my uh, perspective, the rule of law is fundamental to everything that needs to be done. But it has to be administered uh, in a way that is done without fear or favour. The whole point of justice is that justice is blind. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter who you are. Justice has to be administered in a fair and equal way. That was the point that was being made. Uh, and I hope, uh, Chair, that there's not going to be any mischief made today about clumsy wording when I have been unequivocal in my condemnation of violence from all sides during this past week. And indeed, can I say, I've always been unequivocal in my condemnation of violence throughout my long time in elective office. Well, thank you for that, First Minister. And of course, accountability is never mischievous. Uh, and I think it's important to get the accountability. Uh, and the reference there, the, the remark was clumsy, is certainly welcome as clarification for that. But I suppose another element that needs to be um, addressed is that for nearly a full week, um, there was a, a, a volley of remarks being made at the Chief Constable and the Senior Management Team of the PSNI that they should resign. And then on the as we approached the weekend of that, we had large gangs of youth throwing petrol bombs and stones at the police. Do you see a connection between the remarks being used as politicians and then how uh, people in the community perceive that and then use that and turn it into violence? And how do you need to be careful with the words that we use? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. This is not accountability. This is political, no, yeah, this is political grandstanding going on. At the, order, order. the first minister's responding, please, Christopher. Yes. No, but I think everyone can see exactly what's going on, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. sorry. I'm sure you'll get your headline in your local newspaper. But if you want to actually ask the minister about the function of her department, then I suggest your time would be better spent doing that. Sorry, if we can go back to the first I, uh, I always know when I come to this committee, um, uh, Mr. Stalford, uh, it's not actually about the departmental functions that I'm asked, but about political matters from the chair. But so be it. Uh, the chair has lectured me on accountability. And of course, uh, as a public representative, I have a right and a duty to hold uh, those who uh, behave in a way that allows the law not to be administered in a fair and equitable way to account. And that's exactly what I will continue to do. I will hold people to account, just as you will hold me to account. And I think that's very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I, and I welcome that you acknowledge that it's for, for everybody to hold everybody to account. And that is what I see, certainly, as the purpose of this committee. Deputy First Minister, the places that were most impacted by the recent violence were areas of the highest deprivation in the north. Now, there has been certainly a failure by this and previous executives and of the communities department to deliver a comprehensive anti-poverty strategy. So what impact do you think that social deprivation has had on the actions that we saw last week? And do you think that it is now time to demand that the community ministers delivers us the much needed anti-poverty strategy so that we can challenge the root causes of deprivation that are so evidently linked to the social unrest that we saw? Thanks, Chair. And maybe I'm not sure if you're in the chamber or engaged in the conversation we've had over recent um, weeks where the community's minister was very forthright in actually speaking about the need to address poverty, the fact that she actually has the anti-poverty strategy out in the public domain, that that is stuff that's all being worked through right now, that she's very committed to delivering an anti-poverty strategy and that she'll need the support of every single executive uh, minister, which all of our parties belong, um, and every single uh, government department actually in order to be able to tackle that because as we know poverty comes in many forms and that we need to be able to address the root causes as you say and I'm a big believer 
in making sure that we get in at the front end as opposed to tackling the symptoms of poverty. We need to get in it from the very, very outset. So I think we all need to be very focused on making sure that is a priority. And I'm glad that the Communities Minister has uh, that work out in the public domain and is actually working in terms of designing that, 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 that work. I think you, you started off by making a, a point around um, justification. So let me be very, very clear that there isn't any justification for what we saw on our streets over the course of recent um, weeks. You know, the destruction, the violence and the threat of violence is completely unacceptable and it's not justifiable in any, you know, in any form, no matter what concerns people have. And people are entitled to have legitimate community concerns, but they should be voiced in a way that is dealt with via politics, that is dealt with via discussion and debate. So. Um, I'm certainly open for that conversation, as I'm sure you're, you are, and I'm sure all uh, members of this committee are. There are those people in society that are attempting to use and abuse our children, and they need to be called out, and there can be no place for them to hide. And I think that's incumbent upon all of us in political leadership, all of us that hold elective office, to make sure that we uh, do that uh, and that we work together. And I, and I, you know, would um, say to the committee chair and to, to all, you know, we need to work together to make sure that this does not happen. We all have our own individual responsibilities in terms of the communities that we represent. And then we have a collective responsibility. So I do welcome the fact that the executive has a unity of purpose in terms of calling this out. And actually um, called for calm last week um, whenever we came together and we issued a collective executive statement. So I welcome the fact that we have got, um, got to that point. And I think we need to remain in that position in coming weeks because we cannot allow um, the the violence and the, the unrest to return onto the streets. So that's a policing response, it's a community response, it's a political response, and that's the only way in which we'll be able to um, deal with these issues. And then finally, um, Chair, just to say, obviously, I'm sure the committee would join in sending um, our best wishes to all those officers that were injured as a result of what happened in the streets in, in recent weeks. But for me, I think where all of our attention and focus should be in the weeks ahead is to make sure that that doesn't return. Okay, Ministers, thank you for those responses. I'm going to pass that to the Deputy Chair to Doug for questions. Thank you, Chair. And, and First Minister, Deputy First Minister, thank you um, very much for, for, for your answer so far. And maybe I'll start in a slightly different tact. And, and, and actually, uh, I think you've been very clear in your condemnation of uh, the mm -hmm. violence. Uh, and, and I'm thankful for that. And I think... Um, uh, everybody is quite clear that there is no excuse to the violence. It, it does nothing to progress any fair political um, or or community concerns uh, into relation to what's going on now. And and I wonder if you could comment on, on the following, because here's where I have a genuine concern, if I can put it to maybe both of you, is that for some reason, if you voice a concern as a unionist, you're seen as stoking the flames. Yet if you mm -hmm. voice a similar concern from anybody else, it's just voicing a concern. And, and I'll give you an example, if I may, please. Uh, you know, one of our own ministers, um, Declan Kearney, and a very, uh, I think, important article on the 15th of February uh, about the, the, the police and um, touched on the makeup of the police. Uh, and I thought it was a fair opinion, and I, and I read it, and I disagreed with it. I didn't see him stoking the flames in any shape or form. But for some reason now, when a unionist raises a honest, genuine concern, and I'm trying to do it in a in a non-inflammatory manner, um, it's viewed as stoking the flames. So, is it insidious now that a unionist raises a concern within politics? So, thank you for what is a very important point, um, if I may, Deputy Chair, because I think a lot of unionists have felt that the inequity that has been shown towards people who have tried to raise their voice about a range of concerns um, from the iniquitous protocol through to policing, through to the PPS decision, through to other decisions that have been made um, in the Assembly, um, and the feeling that they're not being listened to uh, is dismissed. I think that's wrong. I think everybody should have a voice uh, in the process where very much trying to say to people, and I agree with Michelle around this, that we need to listen to all of the voices. Uh, we need to engage with those voices uh, to try and bring some clarity to some of maybe of the misconceptions that there are. So, for example, uh, Deputy Chair, I know that you will know that uh, our own office has a range of programmes that is there to try and deal with some of these systemic issues arising out of our past. 
uh, whether that's delivering social change, uh, urban villages, communities in transition, the social investment fund, the TBUC uh, funding overall, um, and how we've been engaging with our young people to try uh, and get them to interact with each other across communities. Um, I think some of the work that has been carried out has been really meaningful and has been impactful. Uh, the question is, what else do we need to be engaged in as an executive office to try and make a difference to some of those young people who frankly feel left behind in a process where they see other people uh, not being left behind? So uh, it is really about trying to say to people that we are listening, we are very much engaging in what we need to do to try and help you. It's trying to say to people, you are not forgotten about, you're not dispossessed, but actually we want to listen and, and to act. So I think that is a very important point, uh, Doug, and I, I'm very pleased that you made it. Mm -hmm. If I could just say, Doug, I mean, obviously people are entitled to, to feel what they feel and people are entitled to express their, their view. Um, and we should all be encouraging people to engage in politics, to you know make that the forum in which to express their view. There's no space or room for the violence on the streets for that you know for that um, activity at all, and there's no space at the table for those groups that are orchestrating in any way any of this thing. With you know the criminal gangs that we know exist. Um, you know here we are sitting today, just past the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, the promise of hope and something new and something better. And if you see if there's communities that have been left behind, or sections of the population that don't feel that, then that's something that we all have to be engaged in and something we all must work harder on but we certainly shouldn't be in any way entertaining those um those organized crime gangs that are still involved who are using and abusing young people and like whilst they sit in the comfort of the comfort of their own home the youngsters are out on the streets getting themselves a criminal record which jeopardizes their life chances and that's something that needs to be condemned and called out at every um turn you know i, I think that you know people have make their own assessment around what what each other say in terms of um, our own political analysis and we all come from very different political standpoints and very different perspectives and, and, and won't agree uh, on things but is not the nature of politics that's how you should deal with things as opposed to being able to uh, you know I didn't get my own way so therefore I must instigate um, you know whipping up fears and tensions and that's something that I, I do be concerned about whenever I look at some um, th some of those in, in political leadership and some of the language that I see uh, in terms of, you know, violence or unrest. And even today I saw more commentary from an MP, which would really, really concern me in terms of stoking up um, more tension. So let's let's use this time. And I certainly wanted to, to be in front of the committee today to say that we need to work together. Um, let's work together in terms of um, ensuring that we reach out to those harder to reach, um, perhaps young people or communities that in any way feel isolated or don't feel the benefit of where we are today, because that's something that we all should be concerned about. Uh, thanks, um, uh, First Minister Debbie, First Minister. Uh, uh, you know, very, very fulsome and, and uh, I think point um, important answers is because if we take away anybody's political voice, then that is where you have real dangers in in our society. But one of those problems that, that we are dealing with, and, and we all have different points of view in this, coming from different angles, I suppose, um, is is the protocol uh, and the Irish Sea border. And I think it was uh, last month or, or maybe before that, um, the the uh, the Irish Senate uh, on the UK leaving the EU um, gave evidence to this committee. Uh, and the chair of that committee, when questioned by myself, said that the Northern Ireland Protocol damages the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, she was very clear in that, very unequivocal in that. It was logged down. She said it has damaged it. But then we have people who are then saying, you know, we should implement it rigorously. And if we apply those two same those two same comments, what we're saying is let's apply a protocol rigorously that we know is going to damage the very agreement that brought us the peace that we um, have today. Uh, and that fine balance on um, in Northern Ireland uh, is kept because we don't have any hardened borders anywhere. And I don't want to see a hardened border uh, on the island either, um, but I don't want to see it in the, in the, in the Irish Sea. But how do you reconcile that point, that even the Irish Senate are saying that the protocol damages the Belfast Agreement?
First one, sir. First one, sir. Sorry, sorry, I didn't realise I was off, I was off, um, or I was on mute even. Um, yeah, Doug, I didn't see the commentary just in terms of what was said in the, in the committee, but but I would say this. I mean, I think people need to be honest about what this is. I've always said from day one of Brexit, the Brexit wasn't compatible with the Good Friday Agreement. We didn't ask for Brexit. The majority of people here rejected Brexit. We always knew there was going to be dire consequences of Brexit. And what we're facing today is the new political reality, the new trading reality of a post-Brexit era. And, you know, I uh, I welcome the protocol for on in terms of the fact that it gives us um, mitigation, some protection against the worst excesses of Brexit. Um, but it's far from perfect, of course. Um, I would much prefer we didn't deal with Brexit. I'd much prefer we had the position that we had um, previously, but I do think it's really, really important to send a very clear message to those of a British identity um, that the, the Brexit and the protocol, the withdrawal agreement, does not interfere with anybody's identity. That is That issue in terms of the Good Friday Agreement means that the only time we'll ever have constitutional change on this island is if the people here decide that's what they wish to see. And the protocol or Brexit doesn't do anything to jeopardise that. So let me say that very clearly that to all those of a British identity. The Good Friday Agreement is what um, will only deliver constitutional change, nothing else. And I think that it's really, really important that we focus on that. This is now an international agreement. It is, we are where we are today. The British government negotiated um, the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. There are some issues that need to be resolved and I hope that there are resolution to those and there is ongoing conversations. There are committees and, and means that were built into the withdrawal agreement to. Uh, deal with the issues but I think we we'll have to also be forthright and say that because the deal wasn't done right down to the, the last moment um, it meant that there wasn't time for adjustment and to transition into the new arrangements and a lot of businesses particularly in, in Britain were not ready for the new trading realities so we're dealing with a combination of new trading realities because of Brexit in its uh, entirety and then also because um, of adjustment and people having the time to adjust businesses having the time to adjust so I think that where we can find solutions and easements, then that's what, that's what we should be focused on. But um, this is an international agreement. It is an international treaty law uh, now, and it is the British government that signed up to it as well. So we have to deal with that and work together to deal with that and try and find solutions to minimise any of the disruptions, because I never wanted to see interruption in trade, north, south or east, west. Um, that was always my, my very clear message from the outset. So thank you for that, Doug. Of course, the protocol is a political choice um, and whether it's continued with is also a political choice. Um, Article 13.8 of the protocol itself envisages uh, the replacement of, of the protocol. Uh, so that can, of course, occur uh, if um, uh, politics decide that that should be the case. Um, of course, the Act of Union of 1800 um, was uh, principally uh, around trade uh, and economic movements uh, between the different parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, there is a very intrinsic um, internal market within the UK. The supply chains are all very much interlinked. Uh, that's why you're seeing so many difficulties uh, with the protocol. Article 6 of the Act of Union refers back to um, the fact that that was to be a uh, free movement of trade between the different parts of the United Kingdom. And of course, that goes right to the heart of the quality of our membership of the United Kingdom. And that's the fundamental problem uh, with the protocol, the fact that it uh, demeans our full citizenship of the United Kingdom insofar as we cannot have the same economic movements as the rest of the United Kingdom. It damages our, the quality of our citizenship. Uh, and of course, it does damage uh, the Belfast Agreement in terms of the East-West uh, relationship. So the protocol has to be replaced uh, to deal with the Act of Union point, to deal with uh, the trade point, to deal with the identity point. Uh, and that's certainly my position. And uh, hopefully we are seeing some movement uh, in relation to that replacement in the near future. Thank you, uh, Ministers. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, Adam Chair. I know others have needed to get in. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Doug. Um, okay, next up, I have I have indications here from Pat Sheehan and then Martina Anderson. So, if any others are, are looking to ask questions, if they could use the raise hand function, or um, they'll have to maybe send a message because I can't see everybody because of the way the screen is laid out. So, uh, we'll pass over next to to Pat. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, I just want to make some comments on the question Doug asked about raising concerns. 
and and I agree that everyone should be free to raise whatever concerns they have, and of course, I mean, I'm not getting any disagreement that it should all be done in measured terms, but. I just wanted to flag up a couple of uh, interviews that took place in the in the aftermath of the trouble last week. And the first was a, a young lad from around the Shankill. He was a lad of about 19, I think. Uh, very, very articulate. Certainly not the stereotype uh, image that many people would have of young loyalists. Uh, and, and what he was saying was, if, if people keep telling you that uh, you're losing all the time, everything's being taken away from you, your cultural identity is being eroded and so on, and somebody puts a petrol bomb into your hand, why wouldn't you throw it? Uh, and there was another uh, interview in which someone from the Shankill was complaining about the state of the Shankill in comparison to the Springfield and the Falls. Uh, you know, the housing was better, on the nationalist side, the shops were better. There was more uh, commercial premises being built, and and so on and so forth. And I suppose what I'm what the point I'm getting to is, if people are going to voice concerns and and concerns that might raise tensions, they should be supported with evidence, because the evidence doesn't support what's being said at times. I mean. The majority of deprivation and disadvantage is in nationalist areas, uh, yet some have the perception that it's not. So there, there does need at times to be a bit of honesty. Um, so I, I want to move on to a couple of other issues, just a couple of short questions. First of all, I'm sure everyone in the committee is glad to see that there's going to be movement on the uh, victim's payment scheme. Uh, and that the executive has committed to, to making payments when they come due. Now, there, there was the issue about the, uh, about the Westminster government contributing to that. Uh, and I'm just wondering, is there agreement across all the executive parties that, that the British government should make some sort of contribution to that scheme? And will efforts continue to try and get them to do so? Thanks. I don't mind coming back on that, Chair, if, if that's okay. I mean, I think that, yeah, I think we all have responsibility. I think what Pat's highlighting is, is really strong in terms of, you know, the perceptions. Sometimes the perception can be worse than the reality for sometimes for people. So it's important that people are, that they get honest information and, and that we, if, if we're not agreeing with something, you're actually giving people a democratic way in which to voice their concerns. So I think that's really, really important. Can it, just say in terms of the victims' payment scheme, very conscious every time we talk about this, there are um, people who, um, particularly those victims that have been waiting for far too long for this scheme. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that we've got to where we have today, but we still have a huge bit of work to do as an executive. And there is a collective will there um, from justice and finance and ourselves to work together um, to continue to make the case and to press um, the British government for the financial contribution that's required because... The quantum of this game is still um, unclear, but you know, obviously, fairly substantial. And given that the the it's the British government that actually, given their own um, statement of funding policy, when they set policy and they took decisions that perhaps we may or may not have taken, um, we hadn't um, had those discussions. But like they took decisions that, um, given their own statement of funding policy, really, it's it's required that they would fund them. So we're continuing to make the case, and there is a joined up approach to that. And I think that's important but just it's good that we can now i suppose give clarity that the payment will be made um, to the victims but we have a job of work to do to try and secure additional funding otherwise we will be left in a very difficult position around where do we find it and you know where do you take it from um because that's the that's the stark choice that um our our executive will be faced with thanks harleen do you want to come in on that or well i mean you know, it's hard to know where to start with this um, because the the idea that there's no cultural war in unionism from republicanism is for the birds, frankly, when you look at the evidence. Um, flag removed from City Hall, parades blocked, offensive language made towards things that are very dear to unionism, such as POW Avenue instead of the Prince of Wales Avenue, the blocking of a very 
small uh, centenary stone by the Assembly Commission by Sinn Féin. So, I mean, this is just, you know, I could go on and on and on in relation to the offence that is caused um, from republicanism towards unionism, but I don't think that would help anybody. Instead, uh, I think what we should be focusing on is that there is investment uh, uh, through the programmes that I've already mentioned, Chair, uh, in this office uh, into uh, working class loyalist communities. We will continue to listen to what is needed and uh, put more investment into those communities. I'm very pleased that there's a, a new women's centre going into the Shankill very soon. There's new private sector housing, um, being built on the Shankill, very close to Lanark Way, actually, where some of the violence happened uh, recently. So there is development going on, um, but the idea that there's no cultural war against unionism uh, is just not a factually right. Um, and then, sorry, First Minister, in, in regard to contribution from the uh, Treasury towards the victim payment scheme? Are, are all the parties in agreement that, that the, the executive should continue to pursue that? Yes, that's the position of the executive. Okay, and to, uh, I, I, don't want, I don't want to get into a row with the First Minister, uh, but I certainly don't agree that there's a cultural war. And, I mean, if we want to be factual, there is, there's no... Nothing at all in the Stormont estate, for example, that's representative of Irish republicanism or Irish nationalism. Uh, if we take a walk around our, 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 our cities, towns and villages, I mean, there are hospitals named after the British royal family, universities named bridges, streets, uh, monuments and, and so on. There's a complete imbalance uh, and we have never at any stage advocated the tearing down of any uh, monuments or symbols that are representative of either Britishness or unionism. And uh, all, all we seek is equality and balance. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. But I would like to ask another question, um, I suppose... <laughs> It's, it's leading into a question on, on culture because I did an interview last night with uh, E.G. Cahar and the issue of uh, the Agnagelig Irish Language Act came up during that interview. And to use the word that's topical at the minute, there is a perception, and, and I'm addressing this to you, Arlene, that you are dragging your heels when it comes to uh, uh, implementing the Irish Language Act, uh, bringing legislation forward. And I would just uh, like you to dispel that perception. Well, first of all, just to correct you, um, the last time I looked, there was, a, there was a tree commemorating the establishment of the GAA in the grounds of Stormont. There is a huge portrait, and rightly so, to the former Deputy First Minister, uh, Mark McGuinness, uh, within Stormont. And as... Uh, things develop within a storm of the state I'm sure there will be other things as well um in terms of uh, i think you're talking about the cultural package because of course we didn't agree to uh, a freestanding irish language act as well you know uh, but Sinn Féin members continue to talk uh, about uh, Sinn Féin acts or irish language acts uh, Freudian slip. Um, and uh, it is a cultural package. It is a balanced package that is to come forward so that everybody is respected in Northern Ireland. And I will remind you of the Belfast Agreement that says that the consent of the people of Northern Ireland is needed to change the constitutional status of the uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, so therefore, it shouldn't surprise members of this assembly or this committee that uh, there will be uh, the United Kingdom flag flying within Northern Ireland because we are part of the United Kingdom. So that is absolutely the case. Uh, we have been focused on economic and health matters, principally health matters over this past year. We are now going to have to focus more on economic recovery, economic rebuilding. And I would imagine that that is where everybody would want our focus to be on the executive to rebuild Northern Ireland in a very meaningful way, which is good for all of our citizens. Uh, and I think that's where our focus should be. And I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I got a real answer on that, Arlene, in, in terms of the 
the, the, the cultural package, as you uh, put it, um, where, where is it in the list of priorities for the executive? Well, I think I've just indicated that our primary focus is on health recovery and economic recovery. Of course, we have all signed up to the new decade, new approach. Uh, and sometimes I think um, we should all reread the new decade, new approach, because it talks about respect for everybody and not just one community. Okay, Pat, I don't think you're getting a, an answer there. So can we move sorry, on? Sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Could, could I just uh, raise one other issue quickly? I don't think it'll be too contentious. Just in, in terms of the, of the task force on tackling paramilitarism, especially in the context of the, the orchestrated street violence recently, where, where do things stand in relation to that? Thanks. Arne Michelle. Could just say, um, Chair, just in relation to the previous conversation, I mean, you know, it's really, really important that in terms of our politics, you need to see delivery on the commitments that are made. And, you know, the, the NDNA, the New Decade, New Approach document and agreement, it caters for social, economic and cultural provisions and all commitments must be delivered upon. And certainly that's where, where I'm focused. I think we need to see delivery across the board and the public need to see that political leaders stand by what was signed up to, and that's that's what we all need to be focused on. And um, the Irish Language Act, you know, isn't up for negotiation or renegotiation. It was agreed as part of the package, so I want to see the whole package um, delivered upon in a speedy way as as we can. We were obviously disrupted somewhat because of COVID, but I think it's important that we get back to um, to dealing with 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 um, all the commitments that were made and the things that actually brought us back together politically. The things that actually rescued the 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 three years when the when the assembly and the executive was down. So I do think that we need to be very much um, focused there again. Um in terms of um the, the last question it was in relation to um where does um that work stand. I mean there's a lot of work going on around particularly around one element of, of that program, the community and transition um element and you know and, and members without me getting into all the detail know what we'll, Mm. Okay, I think we uh, temporarily lost the deputy first minister there with uh, internet connection. Um, so, okay, just, so to, just just to to be clear, uh, in terms of the broader tackling paramilitarism program and to achieve lasting change within the communities uh, which it is active in, uh, chair, it will only work when all parts of the program are implemented and that of course includes the paramilitary crime task force our youth work our communities and transition piece and all of the other parts which were identified uh, when we did that work a number of years ago so it's important that all of those programs continue okay um pat we'll move on then to uh to martina if you wanted to ask your question and um it may not be to the deputy first minister at this stage. I think she's maybe in the process of logging out and back in again. But if you want to go ahead with a question, yeah. Well, firstly, I, I would like to um, just pick up on what um, the the joint first minister had said around perceptions mattering, and it's in the context chair of what you asked about the anti poverty strategy, because I think it would be important that anyone listen. Uh, into this committee today, um, as the ministers would know, and myself as Sinn Féin anti-poverty spokesperson, I welcome the fact that Minister Hargi established a panel and that that panel has completed its work. And it has produced recommendations to inform the anti-poverty strategy and co-design groups were brought together and they are working, unfortunately, with people who have the lived experience, but that's important. I only say unfortunately because who would want people to be experiencing poverty? But they are involved in the design of the anti-poverty strategy. So, Chair, I just say that because of what uh, Michelle had said around perceptions mattering to people and honest, honesty and factual information 
uh, being being crucial. I think when uh, when we're dealing with issues, and I just don't want to leave people out there with the impression that nothing is happening. There's a lot of work being done on the anti-poverty uh, strategy. Can I say in relation to um, some of the comments that is made? Look, obviously around the, there's no protocol in the English Channel. And uh, we look at the difficulties that Brexit is unfortunately causing bus businesses in Britain. You know, exports are down 75% in, in food and drink. So we're all mindful of the implications too that Brexit is having uh, in Britain as well as here. Could I ask the ministers who are two ministers who have failed of access to the executive office in Brussels? Um, if both of you would see the value of the continuation of such an office, because I think now more than ever, we, we need a base there. We need a place there where we can have uh, exchange of views with, with people in Brussels. So uh, could I just get some information with regards to the intention of the Brussels office? Well, just in relation to the Brussels office, the office in Brussels, uh, as you rightly said, has been an important vehicle uh, to represent the views of Northern Ireland um, in Brussels. Uh, that work continues, uh, and the role of the office will change, of course, because it will reflect our changing relationship with the European Union uh, and our international interests. And it's still co-located, as you will know, Martina, with in yeah. Ireland, uh, and that will continue. Uh, and that will help us to coordinate with our well. Well, that Okay, Martina, I'll be back to yourself because the Deputy First Minister is still not online. So. No, I, I leave it at that because look, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of questions already asked and answered, and um, I just think that for the time that's in it, um, we just need to lower the temperature. Okay, thank you for that, Martina. Can we move next then to, to Trevor Long, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Can I just check if you can hear me okay? Yes, indeed, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, can I just want to go back reluctantly to the question of the cultural package, including the Irish Language Act, and uh, ask the First Minister. I mean, back in, I think it was a January meeting, yeah. when those questions asked about this, and, and she gave, you gave us a, a very firm commitment that this package would be completed and become law during this mandate. Now, the last time we were here, which was about uh, six weeks ago, I thought you backtracked slightly on that. You said it was your intention to do this. And now today, it, it seems as if there's a wee bit of equivocation as to the, the prospect for bringing this thing through in time for the end of the mandate. So could I ask um, the First Minister for reviews on that as I stand at the moment? Well, there's no change in my views. Um, I almost okay. feel like saying events, dear boy, events. <laughs> I mean, none of us knew that COVID-19 was going to come after we signed off a new decade, new approach on the 11th of January, uh, that on the 26th of February, we would have our first case of COVID-19. And this committee knows better than any other committee that we have been absolutely engulfed uh, with trying to deal with that situation over this past year. So all of the other things that we had committed to doing, and that's why I say people should revisit the New Decade, New Approach, and I can absolutely understand why some people uh, would rather point to the bits that they want to see delivered as opposed to the bits they don't want to see delivered. There's a whole package in New Decade, New Approach uh, in relation to what needs to be delivered. So there has to be a realistic conversation on what we can deliver before the end of this mandate and what will need to carry over into the next mandate. But make no mistake about it, I am not resiling from New Decade New Approach. I'm not. But I am simply saying to you, as I said, events. Okay, thanks for that. Um, also, I wanted to go back to the Troubles Permanent Disabled Payment Scheme. Now, I very much welcome the statement that's come from the Executive Office in terms of a reassurance that the money will be available to make payments as they fall due. But th there's, a, there's a bit of a contradiction in it, isn't there? I mean, all, all three departments involved in this have already said that they don't have any budget to, to put against these payments. And as we stand at the moment, the British government has said they're not going to contribute. So, And it seems to me that uh, 
what has happened here is the, 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 the court's approach and their involvement has forced uh, the, the government to make this confirmation without any real recognition of, of where the money is to come from should payments become due in the next short time. Look, sorry, I don't mind. Come, come oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, apologies. I cut out. I don't know what happened, but it just threw me out and I'd bother getting back into the meeting. But just on that point, um, Trevor, the um, you're right in a way because you know, we in one hand, like we were desperately trying to get to the point where we could confirm for victims who've been waiting for far too long that the payment will be made, and I'm glad we can say that now. We nearly can step, step, set that to, to the one side, but on the other hand. The executive is left in a very, very difficult position where we'll have hard choices to make around how we fund the scheme. So given the 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 fact the scheme is so wide, given the fact that we can't put a value to the costs at this stage, I'm and I think we're all concerned about how and where this all will end up. And that's why we we have to continue with um putting pressure on and drawing attention to the fact that the British government designed it. Those are policy decisions that have us in the space that we are um, where we are today and you know their own statement of funding policy says that they must fund whenever they have made the policy decision so we are continuing to work collectively and we hope to bring some pressure to bear and we hope to be able to be successful but as we stand here today the if, if that's not forthcoming um an already a ready challenging financial position for the executive is going to be made even more difficult and we will and the finance minister has been clear in saying There'll be hard choices for us as an executive to make around where do we take the money from. You know, you have a health service that's stretched to the limit that's going to need huge investment to be able to recover. Um, it was already stretched before the pandemic. It's even more so now. Um, the state of our waiting list, all those things. We're, we're going to have so many um, issues that need additional resource and we're going to be stretched to the limit and this is going to be um, very challenging for us. Okay, uh, just one more, Chair, and it's quite a, a that'll lower the temperature of you, but it's quite an easy one. Uh, it's good to see the schools back. I mean, that's that's the that's the big story of the easements that were made last week. But I'm I'm getting a fair bit of uh, contact from of all people, music teachers. Yeah. You're com complaining. As I see the first minister smiling. They're complaining that while you know, particularly primary schools are are back that they're not allowed to sing in class. And as far as I know, they're not allowed to use wind instruments either, which, I mean, the, the singing thing is perhaps slightly ridiculous, but the wind instruments thing is beyond belief. Uh, so I know you're going to meet tomorrow to consider further easements. Can I ask you to think seriously about allowing children who are back in school and delighted to be there to be allowed to sing and play the flute if they have one? Well, Trevor, the, the difficulty is with all of this, and I, I have received, like you, a number of uh, very vociferous music teachers who do a wonderful job, um, is the aerosols when you sing. Uh, I am on record as saying the one thing I miss is congregational singing in church. Uh, I mean, you're not supposed to sing in church, but even behind your mask uh, in a loud way, um, because the aerosol that comes from that and from wind instruments um, uh, may cause the uh, COVID-19 to transmit. So we are looking at this issue because, as, as you rightly point out, there's been a lot of traffic uh, over this issue. And the joy that you get from music at school is not something that we should forget because we all remember being in school choirs and uh, being in school orchestras and things like that. So it's very important that we are able to give a positive message around that as soon as we can. Uh, and thank you for that. I, I would just comment, First Minister, uh, that the, the church that I play the organ in, which is the same denomination as your own, uh, is singing quite merrily these last couple of weeks. Well, I'll not and tell the bishop if you don't. Uh, they have to wear a mask and sing softly, but... Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the matter the point. Is, matter is joking, you know? <laughs> Behind a mask. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay, and, and um, I like the remark about the orchestras and choirs that we were all part of. Alas, I never was. I was given the triangle and told to stand in the corner, and, and that was my contribution in terms of music. We're going to pass next to uh, Christopher Stalford. Well, um, as, as a good Presbyterian, I don't have a bishop to be frightened of. And when I was at school, uh, my favorite, uh, when I was at school, my favorite instrument was the dinner bell. Um, anyway, um, there's a few issues that I want to raise. Um, Firstly, 
Um, I, I appreciate the comments that have been made about the poverty strategy. In my maiden speech when I was elected here, I pointed out that someone born in Sandy Row or Donegal Pass can on average expect to live 10 years less than someone born at Finicky Crossroads. And that has been the case in my constituency for 30 plus years. So I wonder if you could talk to just the type of interventions that you envisage the government undertaking in order to um, tackle these long-standing and, and deep-rooted issues around deprivation, um, particularly in, in, in the context of inner city Belfast. Okay. Can I just say, in terms of the um, the anti-poverty strategy, I'm sure Christopher knows this, that the it's out for um, co-design, so that's that's where it sits. So it's actually trying to bring in all the partners, all those that have a role, because as I said earlier on, and you know this, that when it comes to tackling poverty, you need that sort of holistic approach. And if we don't take, get right to the root causes of why it occurs in the first place, so that's everything from, you know, um, being able to have a job, getting access to employment, employment prospects in your area, it's about having a decent home. It's about, you know, um, the, the analogy you used around, you know, uh, lifespan, it's the same thing. I remember whenever I was doing the health transformation plan, one of the, the examples that I was using was that if you lived in Lisburn Road as a part composed to, or, um, in comparison to West Belfast, your life expectancy was, I think it was 10 years uh, addition. So, you know, that shows you that what the challenge and the scale of what we need to tackle. But if we don't have a holistic approach to this, then we're not ever going to be successful. So that comes in. There's an educational role to play then, right? Early intervention. It starts at Sure Start, that early intervention. So um, I think that whenever we get the anti-poverty uh, work done with the co-design group, and there's a very clear terms of reference there, and they're working their way through that, I think what we need to do, I think every executive or every um, scrutiny committee should be involved in that work. You know, what's my department's role? And then let's work together. But um, they have been um, been, been given a number of priorities to sort of work their way through. And um, they'll come back to us with recommendations as to how we're going to do it. But it is going to be cross-departmental. That's the only way we'll be successful. There, there are other schemes, obviously. Um, and I know that on Sunday of, on last Sunday there, there was a story in a newspaper regarding one of the schemes that the executive office oversees was a front page story. Can you confirm, or can either of you confirm, that the design for that scheme was put in place long, long before the trouble that we have seen uh, in recent days? Because I think it's important that there can be absolutely no doubt in the public mind that the government of Northern Ireland is not in the business of trying to buy people off who break the law. I think it's really important that that message is sent very loudly and clearly. So, Christopher, thank you for asking that question. Uh, and I hope that somebody would ask a question about our Communities in Transition program because the story on the front page of the Sunday Life was hugely misleading uh, in terms of the work that has been going on. Um, Communities in Transition comes from Action B4 of the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime program. And that is that we should establish a fund to support ambitious initiatives aimed at building capacity in communities in transition, including through developing partnerships across civil society and across community divisions. So the project has been delivered in eight areas of focus at present. Uh, what the focus of the article was, was the fact that the budget had been secured for next year. Actually, I think the bid for the budget was 12 million. Uh, and we were able to secure, secure 10 million. So it's actually a, a, a reduction in terms of the CIT budget. Um, but the project at the moment is delivering in Carrick, Fergus and Larne, Kilcooley and Rathgill in North Down, Kilwilkie and Drumgask in Lurgan Craig Avon, Brandywell Craigan in, in Derry, Londonderry, the Shankill, New Lords and Ardoin in North Belfast, West Belfast, and then uh, East Belfast at the Mount and Valley McCart. So we're already doing work through this communities and transition and you will know that uh, very well um, and i've seen some some brilliant uh, actually uh, engagement through the communities and transition whether it's anti-drug um, and health and well-being programs whether it's community safety programs 
very recently I've seen an absolutely wonderful new mural uh, which was unveiled on the Shankle by a chap from I think Essex who had came over to to do it and it was about trying to inspire young people from that area that they could do and go anywhere in the world um, so that sort of thing the communities in transition has already been engaged in and what was talked about in the press is actually the program for next year uh, so it's not about handing money out to rioters it certainly isn't uh, it's actually about taking people away from the influence of paramilitarism and, and, trans, and transitioning them into a better place. And, and to your point, you know, about anti-poverty strategies and, and engagement, it is about that multi-layered approach to how we can raise those communities up. And you will know better than anybody that BSCR, for example, in the Shandy Road do a great bit of work in relation to trying to help their community to raise their, raise their lives uh, and to do something different. Because, you know, because we're in a very personal level. My mother's from a family of eight, as you know. Um, her youngest, one of her younger siblings died in her 60s, whereas all the rest of her siblings lived to their 70s and 80s. Why? She lived in the Donegal Road. So, you know, uh, I, I just feel very passionately about us intervening in a very meaningful way in these communities, not just uh, in a sort of a single strand oh that's Deidre Hargy's issue let her deal with it but actually a whole of government approach to dealing with uh, some of these working class communities so that we can intervene in a real and meaningful way. Thank you and just one final question and um, as you can see uh, I'm declaring an interest here and I think uh, yesterday Pat Sheehan declared the same interest to me. Um, the economy minister yesterday called for dates to be included in the roadmap for opening up the economy. Hairdressers is obviously one of the things that people want to see opened up, but just as a general principle, would it be the intention of the executive at some point to be inserting dates into the roadmap in order that we can give people a sense of hope? And further, um, I have to tread carefully in how I say this, I think it's important that every time your branch of the government steps up to announce easements or the lifting of restrictions when either First Minister or Deputy First Minister are doing press conference. It can be very disheartening for people when another branch of government, and I'm not referring to the Health Minister, pops up to insist that, you know, oh, we have to go extra slow and these restrictions will maybe, maybe have to be reimposed. That knocks the heart out of people and it knocks the hope out of people. So if there was a sense of dates and um, a time frame, I think that would really help people and, and give the community that sense of hope. Just to say that, Christopher, we have been asking for some time that we start to put dates to, and I think it was right that we took the approach we did at one point in time, given um, just the severity of the situation that we were facing, and we were saying we were data-led, given the, the significant uncertainty. But now that we have a bit more headroom because things are becoming a bit more clear in terms of the current position, hospital numbers are falling, ICU numbers are falling, we've reached the one million mark on the vaccination rollout. So all that gives you space, I think, and both myself and Arlene have been um, speaking with officials for some time saying that we wanted to see dates put to this. So I'm glad that now, I'm hopeful actually that tomorrow the executive will be able to sign off on dates on what it looks like for the next number of months. But I do think that, you know, it's the hope that people want, everybody desperately wants something. I think our society needs this, particularly given recent weeks. I think it's important that we give people something to look forward to in, in the weeks and months ahead. But I do think we do have to also caveat everything with, um, we need to be careful because even though we're able to open things up, we don't want to go reverse, so let's keep going forward. But the public have been very patient, particularly through this latest wave, and have worked with us, and I think they've understood where we're at, but you know, we also agree that we're now in the place where we're all desperate to get our hers done too. Compare that interest, um, and you know, but we are trying to get, and I hope that we think we'll have a very hopeful and positive announcement to make tomorrow. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much from uh, long-heard Christopher Stalford there for that question, uh, and we'll move then. If we could ask George to come in next for the question, please. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I've one or two questions here. Um, the first one is in relation to the victims' payments. 
which is very, very welcome. It's great to, to see finally that uh, these people are <clears throat> going to be compensated. And my question would be that um, there's it's going to cost an awful, awful lot of, lot of money. And uh, the, the, the Treasury doesn't seem to be, want to cough up very much. Uh, is there any other fund, funding streams, maybe from churches or so forth, that um, has been asked to contribute? That's, that's my first question. Um, Pat Sheehan had mentioned earlier about monuments and so forth. And I can honestly tell him, and I'm not trying to prolong the debate on it, but um, when I was in the Mavari Borough Council for quite a few years, and there's one stage, there was um, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Mr. Massey, was erected outside the council buildings. And Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin were in the largest party, and they had everything in their power to get that removed along with maybe mugs belonging to um, Prin Princess Diana, anything British, they wanted it cleared out of the out of the chamber and out of, out of the council. So I'm not going to prolong the situation, but I just want to make sure that that's, that's aired. Thank you. Thanks, George. Um, I think in terms of the victim's pension payment, George, it was really important that uh, the undertaking was given to the court so that people weren't concerned about were they going to get their money. Um, uh, so that is that is very clear now. The money is going to be paid when it falls due. So I understand from speaking to the Justice Minister, the applications will be open in June um, and then people will be able to apply and we will have to find the money to pay uh, those people their rightful uh pension payment uh, and it's right that we do that and we will continue to have those discussions with our own government uh, in relation to the funding. I think it's right uh, that the funding does come from government. I understand what you're saying in relation to other sources of funding but uh, I don't think that is going to happen because we're continuing to have con um, conversations with the churches actually about the historical institutional abuse issue um, where we hope that they will come forward uh, to support us uh, in that respect. Uh, just in relation to your final point, I completely understand the point you're making because similar experience in Fermanagh District Council when all the uh, British military issues were taken out of the council at the behest of Sinn Féin, despite the fact that Enniskillen is the only garrison town that raised two regiments of, of the British Army, uh, and it was quite disgraceful that that happened. But, you know, people mm -hmm. forget that these things happened, but I certainly haven't forgotten that that happened uh, in Enniskillen. Mm -hmm. Sure, just sure, one supplementary. Okay, we just um, go on ahead, um, Michelle, if you're answering the question, then we'll go back to George for another question. All right, okay. I was just going to make the, a point in relation to um, the stone monument to mark the centenary of the establishment of the Northern State. Again, again for, that, for me, that highlights the need for the continued transformation of the society. And just importantly, it, it underlines the need for an inclusive discussion about all of these things. And all public spaces need to be reflective of all identities and unfortunately that isn't the case but I think that if we focus on um, what's required of us as per the Good Friday Agreement and as per you know building a better society I think it has to be about genuine mutual respect it has to be about generosity of spirit it has to be about grace and a real desire to appreciate the lived experience of each other and that's what should be required from everyone including um, the state and non-state, you know, it need, all of us need to be focused on that. So for me, I'm I'm about looking to the future and the future isn't set in stone. Um, it shouldn't be feared. It's there to be shaped. It's something for us all to embrace and actually make something better. So um, my message would be let's let's be visionary and let's be ambitious for future generations as opposed to always looking behind us. I think it's important that we look towards the future. Okay, George, will you have back in again? Yes, sir. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll just be very, very brief. And Arlene, at the very beginning, had uh, mentioned about the protocol and so forth. And I fully support Arlene and, and what, she, what she has said. And just my last point is the R rate. Um, I haven't heard very much in the last few days or the last maybe a few weeks in relation to where the R rate is at the, at the present time. Could someone elaborate on it? So, George, once the number of cases um, become quite low, and I'm very pleased to say that, again, um, the number of positive cases reported today is below 100. Um, we have 70 people with COVID in our hospitals and only eight in our ICU with COVID. Once the numbers fall below a certain level, 
Um, the mm -hmm. R number is not as accurate uh, as it would be when we had a lot of cases. So that's why we don't talk about the R number as much now. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you were to look at the R number, it would have um, a, a margin of error that would be quite wide in terms of uh, it could be in between mm -hmm. this and in between that. But we do know it is still below one, and that's the important issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, George. Okay, I'm going to ask next for Trevor Clark for a question, if Trevor's there. Yeah, yeah sorry, Anna, I, I wasn't there for the first part of the meeting, for something else actually, Chair, so I apologise for that, and I, I missed uh, a, a portion at the start. But I suppose it's just to go over, cover some of the old ground, um, and maybe I maybe want to pull up maybe language, we're always talking about language. Um, the Deputy First Minister talked about the Irish Language Act. There's nowhere in the data that there was an Irish Language Act, there obviously there's a cultural piece which may include Irish. But that aside, I think given all the conversations we've talked about finances and the long list of things that were in the NDNA agreement, it would actually be useful for the committee maybe to get a list of those to remind everybody what's on those. And also costings, estimated costings of what it's going to cost to deliver each and every one of those. Because I think, I think each of us will have our own ideas of what we would like to see first. But I think sometimes it's useful to get a value beside those and actually what the realistic outcome in terms of what these are going to cost. So if, would that be possible to get something like that? Well, I, I know we certainly did have a list circulated to us, um, I think at, at a point maybe last autumn, which had a full list of all of the commitments that there were in the end. And I, I don't know if there was a monetary value beside that. And I will say to the First and Deputy First Minister in terms of whether that's something that is maybe entirely possible, given that there are some very wide-ranging commitments in there. Is it possible to put financial commitments alongside them? Well, I think, I think even in the back of the chairman, we may have got something in the autumn of last year, but thankfully, as has been pointed out today, the victim's pension has now come along, which is very welcome. But again, of course, as we all appreciate, it comes at a cost. So I think maybe if we could get a refreshed list of what all outstanding items are in relation to NDNA, and if the executive office would give us some sort of indicative idea on terms of the cost, I think that would be useful for some of the discussions going forward. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sure that's. I'm sure the clerk will have that written down there. So, um, uh, anything else on that, Trevor? Are we happy to leave it there? Yeah, I'm happy to leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, there's nobody else indicating to speak unless Emma, if she wants to come in there, because I can't see her, and I know sometimes her the hand function doesn't work. So I'll just ask directly, Emma, if you want to ask a question. No, I'm okay. I'm in a wee tablet, so I do have access to the function, but thanks, Perfect. everybody. Okay, thank you, Emma. Cheers. Thank you for that. First and Deputy First Minister, that uh, all of the questions concluded. Um, about an hour and a half, I appreciate there's a wide range of questions there, and I appreciate your open and honest answers to those. Thank you for coming along, and look forward to seeing you at the next session, whenever it is. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Um, Members, what we'll do, I'll just we'll take a five minute comfort break because we've got other people to move up into the spotlight and other people to move out. And I would suspect that the next uh, session will be for about an hour anyway. So if people want to take, uh, we'll come back again at three thirty uh, and start into the next session. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Just get the broadcasting up and running again. Okay, so we're back on again and we're going to move on then, members, to item six, um, which is regarding the implementation of the protocol in Northern uh, on Ireland, Northern Ireland um, Article 2. Uh, we have on pages 39 to 112 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Maybe if we can ask for the representatives for the from the groups to be brought up into spotlight, um, we can commence with a presentation from themselves. I think we've got them up there now. I 
just can't see them if we've got Les and Geraldine and oh no, my list is there we go. That's, so I can welcome uh, Michael and Geraldine and Les's papers. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> remaining. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm not quite sure what's happening to my camera, but if you, um, I'm not sure how to ready this. But as long as you can hear me, we can certainly hear you. Yes, indeed, which is the important thing. Um, so, look, what we'll do, um, we're, we're very welcome uh, for, to, to the meeting and thank you for coming along once again. Um, it's always appreciated to catch up with yourselves. Uh, Michael, this might be, is this our first time with yourself or have you been with us before? Uh, no, uh, okay. in all your meeting. Um, okay. And it's, and it's, it's lovely that Les is doing uh, kind of a, uh, a variation on the cat ears theme. Uh, yes. It's, it's a real... <laughs> it makes, makes, gets you right here when you see that sort of invention yes. to welcome a new member <laughs> well, look Michael you're very welcome and thank you for, for coming along today so look um, I'll pass over to yourselves who wants to take the lead maybe just to, to give us a bit of an update and then we can move to some questions and answers okay Mr Chairman can you hear me okay Sorry. Can indeed, yes, good to see you. Okay, th thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, speak first, if that's okay with you. So can I just say good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members, and thank you for the opportunity to update you this afternoon on the ongoing work of the dedicated mechanism and the partnership working which has been taking place uh, across the three commissions since our previous committee meet briefing last December. On that point, um, we were in the final stages of preparation in advance of the end of the Brexit transition period, and with it, the Commission's assumption of the new roles and responsibilities in relation to Article 2 of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, which sets out the UK government commitment to ensuring no diminution of certain rights, safeguards or equality of opportunity as a result of its withdrawal from the European Union. Now we're some three months into our new role and we welcome the opportunity to update the committee on the progress we have made on carrying out our functions as a dedicated mechanism. The commissions have been working very closely and constructively together to progress this important work. But I'd like to start by providing you with a brief overview of some of the work that the Equality Commission has taken forward in this area, working in close partnership with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission including our legal policy research and communications work. Les will follow me and provide you with further detail on the work that the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission has progressed. And Michael will then elaborate on the developments related to our joint work to progress all island oversight arrangements. So in terms of our legal work, we have progressed important work to examine the scope of Article 2 commitment so as to ensure that there is greater clarity and certainty as to what Article 2 means. And this has included work uh, to clarify the range of rights protected under Article 2 and the domestic legislation underpinning the EU law that falls within its scope. We have also commenced the tracking and monitoring of legislative developments, both at domestic and EU level in order to ascertain whether they have any potential impact on the Article 2 commitment. We have also been working to ensure that effective mechanisms are in place by which the dedicated mechanism will be kept informed of actual and planned EU legislative developments that are relevant to the Article 2 commitment. Further, we have progressed work to develop internal policies and procedures for the provision of legal advice and assistance to individuals alleging a breach of the Article 2 commitment. With regards to the number of inquiries received by the Equality Commission, these have thus far been relatively low and indeed it was to be expected. Issues which have been raised with the Commission to date include concerns relating to the impact on assistance dog owners as a result of changes to pet passport arrangements, issues relating to the impact of Brexit on citizens' rights and voting rights, the democratic deficit, as well as trade barriers to accessing goods and services. 
Significantly, a number of these inquiries do not fall within the remit of the dedicated mechanism. And as part of our awareness raising role, we are and we will continue to be taking steps to provide clarification regarding the parameters of the Article 2 commitment. In terms of research, we are working to commission research in a number of key areas, including the employment and socio-economic impacts of Brexit on the various Section 75 equality groups in Northern Ireland, as well as on the potential reform of assembly and parliamentary scrutiny measures in the context of Article 2 commitment. Further to our duty to promote awareness of the Article 2 commitment, we have taken forward work to develop a series of publications and other promotional materials aimed at increasing awareness and understanding of the UK government's commitment and the role of the dedicated mechanism. These materials, which will be published very shortly, have been designed to be accessible and user-friendly, and importantly, will set out our key information including on individuals' rights to complain about any breach of Article 2 commitments. A text of our short guide publication was, in fact, provided to the committee members in advance of our briefing today. These awareness-raising initiatives have been taken forward in tandem with a series of stakeholder engagements. And since our last update to the committee in December, we have continued to engage alongside the North Ireland Human Rights Commission with a wide range of stakeholders and partner organisations, including ongoing liaison with the Northern Ireland Office officials, the Labour Relations Agency, the Independent Monitoring Authority, as well as with the Equality and Human Rights Groups. Further engagement with stakeholders, including with trade unions, the legal profession and the Executive Office is planned over the coming months. Similarly, when we last briefed the committee in December, I advised that four management posts had been recruited. But since then, we have recruited a number of temporary staff to ensure service delivery as we continue to progress recruitment to a range of permanent posts to support the legal policy and promotional work of the dedicated mechanism unit. In conclusion, I hope this gives the committee a helpful <coughs> of the progress that has been made by the Equality Commission working in partnership with the other commissions since we last met in December. And I would now like to hand over to Les to provide an update on behalf of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, oh, thanks, um, Geraldine. And apologies for my uh, camera. <laughs> it's not that I, uh, even though my hair needs uh, dealing with, um, it's some technological issue that's beyond my... Um, wit to to sort so apologies for that um we're still in the early days as you know of the ireland northern ireland protocol um <clears throat> and the article 2 mandate to ensure the effective implementation of the commitment to non diminution of rights and safeguards or equal op equality of opportunity section of the belfast good friday agreement uh, like Geraldine, we've recruited staff, we've begun to engage with stakeholders, we're working very well with the Equality Commission and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Um, I want to say something about, um, it's important to remember, I think, that the two commissions are a small cog in a much larger wheel with regard to the overall agreement and our dedicated mechanism work. Um, it's important to say that um, any of the work has to fall within the scope of Article 2. And in effect, there are three ingredients that have to be met for that. First, there must be action by the UK government uh, which diminishes rights that um, were available between the 23rd of June 2016 and the 31st of December 2020. In other words, between the time that the UK decided to leave the European Union and the time that it finally left. Uh, second, that that right in question must be underpinned by European Union law. And third, that the diminution would not have occurred except for the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Now, that's not a straightforward message to, to convey to um, the public and other stakeholders. So um, we too, alongside the Equality Commission, have been looking at the scope we uh, are looking at a number of areas. Uh, one is immigration and migrant worker rights. 
um, and what might be covered within the scope of the agreement. The second is we're looking at some healthcare issues and the common travel area. And thirdly, looking at more broadly freedom of movement issues. Um, but it also, um, I think, must be um, recognised that we both commissions and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission um, have a role outside of the dedicated mechanism. We've got parallel statutory uh, duties. So we can also work on related human rights and equality issues which may arise from other parts of the 1998 agreement. So, for example, in the um, uh, last few weeks, the Commission has given evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and its current inquiry into citizenship. Um, we have presented to the uh, Independent Human Rights Act review members at an event facilitated by the Law Society and the Bar Council. So we're seeking to ensure that the work both within and outside of the dedicated mechanism, which affects the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, is as seamless as possible. Um, like the Equality Commission, we've received a relatively small number of inquiries to date. Um, and to give you a flavour, for example, one is around the decision to not allow individuals with what's called pre-settled status under the EU settlement scheme to claim universal credit, uh, and whether that might fall within the scope of uh, Article 2. As it happens, that matter is going to the Court of Justice of the European Union on a referral from Northern Ireland, from the Law Centre, uh, which happened just before we left the, the EU. Uh, another one which we've done a joint piece of work with is the impact of people being able to move freely across borders with guide, guide dogs. Um, and we've had a number of free movement citizenship inquiries. But I also have to say we've received a number of qu questions on whether the new arrangements amount to a democratic deficit, both in very broad terms, but also some more specific questions, given how the rules apply to Northern Ireland. So it's been very much a mixed bag to date. And that's not altogether surprising, um, given that the Ireland-Northern Ireland Protocol was signed off well before the end of the transition period, but the trade and cooperation agreement uh, was only finally reached a week before the United Kingdom finally left the European Union. So, happy to take questions from members, um, but first I'll pass on to Michael Finucane uh, in terms of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. Okay, Michael. Uh, thank you, Les. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the Assembly. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today representing the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and as set out in the UK government's explainer document of August 2020 on Article 2, the <coughs> Equality Commission of Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission will work together to provide oversight of and reporting on uh, rights and equalities issues falling within, this, within the scope of the Article 2 commitment uh, that have uh, an island of Ireland dimension. Uh, it, it falls to the three commissions to agree uh, how to advance this work and in my remarks I will try and outline how we have progressed this to date. Uh, late last year the three commissions agreed that a working group to progress the all-island work would be established and this would comprise the respective chief commissioners, uh, a board member uh, from each organisation and the chief executives of each commission. The inaugural meeting of the working group was held earlier this year on the 9th of February. Uh, the main business was to consider and finalise a, a memorandum of understanding which would govern the work. Uh, subsequently, uh, this MOU was agreed by the boards of the three commissions. And uh, aligned with the rules set out in the August 2020 explainer document, the three commissions agreed in their MOU that they would work together to provide oversight of and reporting on uh, rights and equalities issues falling within the scope of the Article 2 commitment that have an island of Ireland dimension. Uh, the, the commissions would report separately to the governments of the UK and Ireland as appropriate on any issues that they have addressed jointly in the context of monitoring the Article 2 commitment. That the uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland and the Joint Committee of the NIHRC and IREC as established under the Good Friday Agreement, would bring 
any matter of relevance to the Article 2 commitment uh, to the attention of the Specialised Committee on the Ireland's Northern Ireland pro Protocol as, as appropriate. And then any activities undertaken by the three commissions jointly uh, would, of course, respect existing reporting structures and statutory rules and responsibilities. On the practical working arrangements, uh, the three commissions agreed that the working group would normally meet four times per year to consider areas for working jointly. Uh, the chairing and hosting of the working group would rotate between the three commissions on a yearly basis, uh, with the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland taking the role in the first year. Uh, that our joint working would be overseen at a strategic level by the respective boards of each commission. Any decisions made in line with existing governance arrangements for each board. And then an annual meeting of all the members of the three commissions will be organised uh, to review progress and any issues uh, arising uh, together. And in agreeing to, uh, in addition to agreeing the MOU, uh, our first working group meeting uh, provided a very useful opportunity to share information on implementation of the dedicated mechanism arrangements to date across the three commissions. Uh, we also discussed plans for the first annual meeting of all members of the three commissions, and we've decided to schedule this to take place in the uh, sometime in the year when board members are able to meet in person. We're hoping that board members don't have to undergo too much retraining or further education to discover again what it's like to meet in person in real time. But that's an issue we'll deal with in as and when it happens. And finally, we, we just considered how to best carry out North South civic engagement uh, going forward in the short term. Uh, we've agreed that the three commissions would run a cross-border online event, uh, and this would be aimed at raising awareness of the dedicated mechanism the All-Ireland Scrutiny Rule, uh, and to hear any concerns regarding the impact of Brexit on rights and on equality of opportunity. Um, as you've already heard from my colleagues, uh, officials within the three commissions have been progressing this with the Centre for Cross-Border Studies. So in conclusion, uh, over the last number of months, we, we've put in place the practical uh, foundations and arrangements uh, for working together to address the rights and equalities issues that fall within the scope of the Article 2 commitment uh, and that have an island of Ireland dimension. Looking more towards the future, uh, we're going to continue to build on these foundations uh, and it will have as its main objective and, uh, uh, and motivation the promotion of the rights and equality of all people across the island as they go about their daily lives under uh, the new regime. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the, the presentation. It's um, obviously a very much a live process. It's a process that each time that you come to this, there's been some updates and some movement and some changes. Uh, so it's always good to be kept uh, sort of abreast of those changes um, in real time. And I think these quarterly meetings have been um, useful um, from that perspective. And I suppose that this uh, is the first meeting that we've had into the system. Um, all of the previous ones would have been before um, the, 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 the Brexit officially kicked in. We were in the transition period. So I suppose maybe, is there any, have you noticed any difference now that we're actually in the, the process? And has that, you know, have, have things happened as you expected them to happen? Or is there been a case of having to say, actually, this has really gone in a different way. We need to rethink that. Um, and in terms of the priorities that you have, um, do, do, how, how are you actually dividing your time up through all of the various priorities that you've got set? Is there one strand of work that seems to be kind of the, taking over the majority of the time or predominant amount of the time? Or is it just the case of things are equally um, distributed through all of your priorities? Uh, Mr Chairman, if I can just come in on, on the latter point. Um, I think the, the officers, the officials and the commissioners within the three organisations are working very closely. So there's um, a common understanding of what the, the issues actually are and the work is divided out within each responsibility or the responsibility area of each of the organisations. So it's not a case, you know, the primary objective is to make sure that there is no duplication of effort. Information is shared on an ongoing basis. And I think for um, Les's organisation and our own, um, it's been about defining the scope of Article 2. It is a very complex issue. There are lots of pieces of legislation that intertwine. And it's about getting an understanding of all of that. It's not just as simple as saying it's the six directives. You have to consider 
what actually underpins that and how is that incorporated into UK law, etc., to look for all of the tentacles. So while that is going on, um, they've very much been focused as well on terms of how we might get information from the European Union and how we can make sure that those communication channels are as were intended. Um, we're also looking at the issue of the, I mentioned when I was speaking a few minutes ago about the scrutiny, uh, researching into the scrutiny that the Assembly uh, and Westminster have on this whole process and how stakeholders can actually feed into that process. So we're still very much um, up to our neck in uh, research in terms of legislation, but we're also very conscious of the fact that if anyone does come forward with um, a fear or concern of an alleged breach, we have a very tight time scale to respond to that. Um, you know, proceedings must be lodged within a three month period. So we have to be quite agile and it's trying to preempt that. And I'm sure you've seen the work that we've done in relation to pet passports and in terms of assistance dogs. Um, along with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, we have been engaging with DERA and the Minister for DERA in terms of trying to get that firmly in, on, on the agenda um, and the Northern Ireland uh, Affairs Committee as well in that regard. And I know Les made reference to it. So I think that's our key focus at the moment in terms of, of that being agile, being sure that we have all of the facts uh, and that there's a common understanding of what they are. But just to reassure the committee that the three commissions do work very, very closely together. Information is shared and work is divided out on a basis that they, yep. they, any legal advice is shared equally. Can I just pick up something there, Geraldine, you said, um, in terms of that time scale of there being three months, mm -hmm. is that three months from uh, a new law or is brought in that, mm -hmm. you know, I'm wondering about the timeline in terms of if somebody actually makes a complaint, mm -hmm. um, that will be obviously whenever they're impacted. So if there's a change in the law uh, somewhere, it impacts somebody's rights. By the time they realise that, determine that, and then reach out, and then you actually pick it up and move on, yeah. then what capacity do you have then retrospectively to say, well, actually, there is a problem with that law, so it needs to change? Can it go back to play? Yeah. Or? yeah, no, this is the, the reason why I'm saying we have to be extremely agile and we have to be on top of what's actually happening. Yeah. Um, we have to keep a very close eye on changes or proposed changes to legislation and why it's really critical that uh, we work with NIO in terms of trying to make sure that those um, communication channels uh, that are committed to within the protocol are actually developed because it's three months from the action occurred. Okay. So it's when the, the legislation or whatever was introduced, whatever the circumstances are, not when you become aware of actually is my understanding. I'm sure if there's anything wrong with that, Les or Michael will correct me, but um, that's my understanding that legal proceedings have to be implemented by then. Mm -hmm. And it's not a case of coming to the, either of the commissions to raise the concern. It's when, you know, legal action actually is commenced. Okay, that's, yeah, it's tough work. Look, I'm going to pass out of loads of other questions, but I know a number of others want to speak, and we've we've kept you a bit of time today. So I'm going to pass to Doug as the deputy chair. Um, Doug, are you there? Yes, 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 I am. Go on ahead then, if you want to ask a question or two. Thanks, Chair uh, Les, Geraldine, and, and and Michael. It's always really interesting to to hear what is a very complex uh, issue, and uh, and I know you you know your brief really well, and and I learn so much from you every time you. You speak, but can I ask maybe a general question? Uh, and that general question is is that one of the Article Two rights says an equal right to economic activity, and we're saying that economic activity should not be diminished by this protocol that's been brought in. But surely the, the economic rights have been diminished by people in Northern Ireland due to the Irish Sea border in exactly the same way. If I had put up a border uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, forcing business to instead look south to where they might have done their economic trade to have to look to Great Britain, that would have been a diminishment of their of their rights. I, I, is that an issue that you're trying to tackle, or is that something that you think it isn't an issue? And I'm, I'm really trying to get a sense. Um, um, I wonder if I might pick that up, Doug. If, um, we would be looking at it in terms of equality of opportunity, and that refers to um, class and creed, disability, um, gender. 
um, there is a very broad kind of um, bearing in mind that we're looking at the particular section of the Good Friday uh, Belfast Agreement. It's the um, safeguards, rights and equality of opportunity section. So the much broader issue that I suspect you're, you're kind of alluding to, I'm not sure falls easily, frankly, within that section. Um, and the particular directives around um, equal treatment, for example, that we that are in the annex around employment, uh, around um, self-employment, access to goods and services, is a very are very specific directives about equal treatment within. So a kind of diminution, if you like, of economic activity doesn't immediately strike me as falling within um, our purview. Um, that doesn't mean to say that if somebody came to us, we wouldn't look at it quite carefully to see if there was something within Article 2. But much of um, the issues you're talking about, I think, are other parts of the protocol. Okay, I, 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 I get that. I get that lesson. I, I suppose, I suppose, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm looking at this through primary colours, I guess, in many ways. And what I'm really saying is if, you know, if you're a, if you're a business sitting in Northern Ireland uh, and you had these economic activity, which, which, um, you know, your link was to, to, to the island, to Great Britain, but the protocol came in and actually stops that and forces you, rightly or wrongly, to have to do that trade with, um, the Republic of Ireland, you know, you know, is that not your rights being diminished? In, in the same way, as I have explained, if, if we put a border up on the island of Ireland, stopping that trade north-south and they have to look east-west instead, that would have been a dimish, d d diminishing of, of that economic um, right. Um, yeah, it, it, it may well be, but the prism with which, within which we have to look at this is the very is the one section of the agreement Um rather than the agreement as a whole. Um, it's partly why I said uh, in, in my opening remarks about, but we still have an interest in other parts of the agreement. So the citizenship issues around identity, the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee's inquiry at the moment is of interest to, I'm sure both commissions, in, in our case particularly so, because we've done some work on it. Um, but we know that it doesn't fall within the dedicated mechanism because it's a different part of the agreement. So, um, and obviously we've got our general powers as a, we, we were both the Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission were created by the 1998 agreement. So we retain an interest in those other bits, but in terms of the dedicated mechanism, I would struggle to see how, if you like, the reduction in trade or some of the um, the issues about having to fill out uh, paperwork in order to trade between Northern Ireland and, and Britain and vice versa falls within our bit of the agreement. So it's not about being uh, obtuse. It's about the reality of, of the mandate that we have. Good enough. Let's, uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, as, as always, I, I listen and I'm learning as every time you, every time you speak. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, sir, Doug. Okay, we'll move on then. The next one on my list is Emma. Emma Sheeran. Thanks, Chair. Apologies, every time I hit the unmute button, my wee keyboard pops up. Um, and thank you to you all to you all for your presentation. I know we've had uh, a few at this stage now, and perhaps, and I've raised this point before, that some of the issues that we were expecting to see after Brexit and the immediate aftermath of, of Brexit maybe haven't presented themselves because of the, the whole pandemic. But one of the things that you touched on, I think it was Geraldine that had mentioned it there around sort of access to, to public funds and um, the lack of a right to apply for universal credit for somebody that's got pre-settled status at the minute. And I'm conscious, obviously, that throughout this pandemic, we've seen unemployment rise and we've seen people um, having been forced out of their jobs and people that were on temporary contracts and that. And I'm wondering if we can see a correlation there between people that are in precarious working conditions now being forced into poverty because of, of that uh, lack of ability to, to access welfare. Uh, good afternoon, Emma. Um, it was actually Les who was speaking oh, about yeah. universal credit. So perhaps it would be best to respond to you. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I think I think it probably <laughs> this falls within my um, specialist subject under mastermind. Um, Geraldine has a number a number of them, but um, I think universal credit may be one of mine. Um, it it in terms of the of the, the specific issue, it's a challenge under other parts of EU law. We've looked at it. We don't think it falls within the um, uh, Article Two scope. But again, we have an interest in it because um, it does presage the kind of wider issues about people in, in you know, uh, it it's makes life very difficult for those with pre-settled status to remain if they don't have access to universal credit because many of those people may well be in low paid employment. So your um, wider question, um, we'll see what the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is hearing the case in May, there's a similar challenge going to the Supreme Court from um, organisations in Britain. The Child Poverty Action Group is involved in that. But the wider question around um, cross-border working, frontier workers, um, migrant labour within Northern Ireland, um, uh, clearly, if you have e full EU settled status, you can access all your social security entitlements. Um, whether it's legal to restrict that to um, uh, those with pre-settled status, I hope the answer is going to be no, it isn't, because it does have an impact. Um, and we are going to be reliant on um, migrant labour. We know what the new arrangements are for uh, employers wanting to bring in people uh, now from other EU member states, um, and that is the same rules that apply to those outside, and it does involve um, you having to earn a significant amount of money, you have to acquire a, a number of kind of points, um, and it's designed, there are other schemes for particular groups of workers, um, and those schemes for seasonal workers have very kind of restrictive rights to kind of remain um, within the UK. So there is a, a broader issue that you're raising there. Um, it's too early to tell, to be honest, um, but we will see um, in time. And I'll give you one very small area quickly that I think is, is worth keeping an eye on over the next two or three years. And that's kind of residential uh, staff in residential care. As you know, much of residential uh, and nursing home care is um, uh, private sector. It has relied on migrant labor. And if you now say that in future to bring people in, they have to earn at least a certain sum, considerably more than most people are currently paid, then either we're gonna to have to rely on local labor or private sector are going to have to pay more to bring people in. And if you pay more to bring people in, a number of the people that are looked after in private homes are publicly funded. So how and who is going to fund that? Because money is short in local authorities in Britain and money is short within health and social care trusts in Northern Ireland. So, so there are some conundrums and we'll have to see how those, how those play out. Thank you very much, Les, and apologies, um, Geraldine. I, I wasn't um, taking my notes down properly there, but I just, Chair, if I'm allowed, just uh, uh, one more question, just around the EUSS and, and the cutoff, and I know I've spoken about this before in terms of information sharing, and we know the challenges that exist within our communities across the north of, of migrant worker populations and the language barrier and concerns that have been raised around whether or not people are aware of the process that they're going to have to follow and sort of again the pandemic has had practical implications there in terms of you know stopping the amount of traveling that people are doing and um changing the contact that the people have with each other and i note that there has been um more sort of speculation in the news even today around the rights of uh, irish citizens in the north to exercise that right to bring family members or loved ones here uh, and citizenship because of the fact that the british government uh, view us as british by virtue of birth and i just wondered if you had anything to say on that uh i wonder if this falls to me again but i'll, I'll check geraldine would you like me to pick this no, one no, up you, you go ahead you're doing a great job Les. carry on yeah okay thanks um um well the position is is clear that there are temporary arrangements around your right to bring in family members which apply until the 30th of June, 2021. Um, 
and after that um then your rights if you are covered by the good friday agreement again not part of article 2 but the identity provisions will will lapse so once the eu settlement scheme and there are some arrangements for for late applications um and we need to see what the guidance is and we've been trying to get that from from the home office but there will be an issue where um if someone wants to bring in family members um you would be back into the same position that um Emma de Souza I know she gave her evidence this morning was in and obviously launched a legal challenge which um um was initially successful and then unsuccessful but of course then lapsed because they resolved the matter with the um introduction of the kind of law which assisted Emma that issue is still very much a live one and it's one of the issues that we've commissioned a piece of work on to look at what will happen after the 30th of uh June to those who identify as Irish the issue for us is it sh should be a leveling up in other words both um people covered by the good friday agreement whether they identify as Irish or British should be able to bring their family members in but it's clear that the law will not allow that um uh after the 30th of of June um 2021 All right that's grand thank you thank you for those questions Emma I'm going to move on next then to Christopher Thank you uh, very much and thank you for your answers so far it's been very interesting um folks you'll know that in in March 2011 um the European Court of Justice ruled that um car insurance companies who were specifically targeting um female customers because the records showed they were offering lower rates of insurance to female customers because the records showed that female customers were actually less likely to be involved in a car accident the european court of justice ruled that that contravened equal access <clears throat> to goods and services and even though um they were offering they were making these offers they were basically ordered that it had to stop uh, on the grounds of sex discrimination in terms of my access to goods and services from mainland gb if that's in any way being restricted am i as a uk citizen having my consumer rights violated i think that's um, a very interesting point and it's um my understanding that's really um part of the arguments in one of the judicial review proceedings that are taking place at the moment um in terms of the gender directive it does apply and it used to apply the original thing that that's really bad I, i can't really hear it it's very garbled it must be something that they have checked out Christopher maybe if you put your cell phone the mute it should be the feedback coming yes. through there oh, so yeah, I'll I'll do that. I'm going to let Charlie answer the question okay is is that better Christopher good good okay um as we said We're very aware of the judicial review proceedings that are currently underway and I know the economic rights issue is one of the uh, sort of commercial aspects of one of the proceedings that are taking place. Um as Les has said earlier in terms of economic rights uh, I'm not trying to to fudge the issue but it's something that we're keeping uh, a watching brief on. Um we're not part of the judicial review proceedings I should be aware. um but we are looking at it very closely to see the implications that it might have for the article 2 commitment and for the work of the dedicated mechanism unit uh we don't have sight of any of the papers or the arguments that are being put forward but um we will keep an eye on it and i undertake to come back to you both as a committee and to you directly Christopher if we are made aware of any of the issues that might impact on the work that we do uh, i'm not trying to side step your question but the reality of it is at this moment in time it would appear to be outside the scope of the dedicated mechanism unit but as Les has said earlier we are um we're keeping it under observation okay and just another issue then since since 2010 and I'm you 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 referenced it already but I don't know if all members of the committee are aware of it since 2010 at uh, 250 pups have baby dogs pups have been trained uh in Northern Ireland as assistance dogs 
under the terms of the protocol that has had to stop. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, people who use assistance dogs under the terms of the protocol for travel are being required to provide uh, paperwork. I mean, we're in a situation where Northern Ireland amounts to less than half a percent of the population of Europe, but 20% of the customs declarations are being applied on the stretch of water between Northern Ireland and GB, which I just think represents total overkill on the part of the European Union, but that's their choice. In terms of this issue, preventing the training of assistance dogs and imposing burdens upon blind and visually impaired people for travel, does that constitute a breach of their rights on the basis of disability? Well, that is something that we feel very strongly about and our view is that there should be absolutely no adverse impacts due to Brexit on assistance dog owners in Northern Ireland in respect of pet passport requirements. And we have raised this matter with the Minister of DERA um, and with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. And I'm well aware of the fact that um, the, the pups that are trained as assistance dogs um, they can't be transported into Northern Ireland until they're 12 weeks old because of vaccinations, etc. by which stage it's considered that they're too old for training. So it's something we feel very, very strongly about. And you know that right back in September, whenever we briefed the committee, it was one of the issues that the, <coughs> the Equality Commission actually raised. Uh, and it did get a fair amount of media coverage at that stage. So it's something that we have been very vocal about. Um, we believe that changes to the pes pet passport requirements announced on the 16th of December by the UK government mean that um, Great Britain by the EU for the purposes of pet transport, it will result in some additional requirements on assistance dog owners travelling from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. And we don't think that's right. Um, you can't discriminate against people because of a dis disability. And these pets, these assistance dogs, are part of that process. Um, people with a disability are relying on them for a whole variety of reasons, not just visual impairments. So the commissions, they do support the adoption of measures that will remove any additional requirements that adversely impact on assistance dog owners, including any Northern Ireland assistance dog owners returning to Northern Ireland from Great Britain. They don't have to do anything when they're going the other way, but it's when they're coming back, and that we believe is not right. So the Equality Commission, along with the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, has written to the Minister of DERA, uh, welcoming the Minister's decision to delay the additional requirements for pet travel between Great Britain and Northern Ireland following the end of the transition period until the end of July in 2021. We also raised concerns about the potential impact of these changes on assistance dog owners, including in the context of the UK government's um, commitments under Article 2. We have both raised this concern and evidence to the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, and we have highlighted the UK government commitments under Article 2 and its obligations under C UNCRPD and to the need to ensure that there are no adverse impacts on assistance dog owners in terms of the requirements on pet, pet passport arrangements post-Brexit. And it's something we will continue to be very vocal about and ensure that the rights of disabled people are actually protected in this regard. And it's not just about you know um, one-way travel, it's two-way travel, and it's about making people feel comfortable and welcome without additional burdens. Thank you, uh, Geraldine. I think it, I appreciate you weren't trying to duck the question on consumer rights. The situation is obviously very nebulous, mm -hmm. and there are lots of aspects of this that are going to have to be tested in the courts. And with a bit of luck, we'll be able to strip away about 99% of it. So thank you very much, Geraldine. Can I just say as well, just sort of before we leave it, um, in terms of any alleged breach of the commitments of the UK government um, to uh, Article 2 provisions, it will be the courts that will determine whether or not there's actually been um, a breach. It will not be for any of the commissions or the dedicated mechanism unit, but um, the courts might have a lot of work ahead. Yeah. Can, can I just add one thing, Christopher, to that, which is that um, unlike my kind of answer to Doug, which was a, a bit downbeat in terms of whether the this fell within the that section of the agreement, um, it's pretty clear to me that there's a much stronger argument on this issue because uh, in the section 
the right to equal, equal opportunity in all social and economic activity, regardless of class, disability, gender, or ethnicity. Well, if people aren't able to travel because they cannot um, or have to go through un unnecessary bureaucracy to bring a guide dog from Scotland to Northern Ireland or wherever, then it does seem to me that there are potential for Article 2 to play out. So I think there's a much stronger case to say this is an issue um, that if it isn't resolved amicably in other ways that, that might fall into one of um, our two commissions, Bailiwick, to do something further on. Okay, thank you for that. I suppose I should explain the echoey sound there come because Christopher is the principal deputy speaker has such a plush office and so large and high ceiling. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to move next to Martina Anderson, please. Martina. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you all, all three of you, for the uh, for the information you imparted today. I have lots of questions. Uh, I'll try to refrain from asking them all, Chair. But Geraldine, you talked about the scope. Uh, that you have scoped out the range of the Article 2 rights. Um, are you still at, uh, involved in that exercise or is that scope and finish? Because obviously, if you have a breach of your rights, you need to, we need to know what the extent of that, uh, what, what do they cover? And I'm not, I'm not clear on that. Yeah. Um, the short answer, Martina, is that no, we haven't finished that work. Um, I was trying to get across the fact that it is a very complex and large piece of work. Uh, given the, um, it's not just as simple as the six directives, it's all the underpinning EU legislation, domestic legislation, uh, UK legislation, and how they all impact uh, on each other, uh, and the tentacles that spread into other pieces. So no, that work is not finished, but um, I just would like to give a reassurance that if someone does come to us with concerns about a potential breach of any of the commitments, we immediately put the resources to that to investigate that issue so that we assist that person within the time frame. That's why I made reference to the three months earlier. So no, it is a, um, a monumental piece of work. Uh, a lot of work has been done to date, but it is still ongoing. Do we have a time frame as to when you anticipate it being complete? Um, not at this moment. I don't have a time frame, but we'll be happy to come back to you with that when I get more information from uh, the officers, and I'm sure Les will as well, because we're working this um, uh, in partnership. So um, maybe when we get a chance to have a little bit of a discussion as to the progress that's being made, we can come back with more detail. Yeah, well, these regular briefings we all find very, very useful, very helpful. Michael, I don't know if this is for yourself in relation to um, as a, an Irish passport holder, as an EU right holder, um, then Ireland being one of the very few member states that doesn't afford its citizens who uh, who don't decide in that state the, the right to stand, the right to vote in European Parliament elections? And would there be work, for instance, that, that you would take forward uh, to look at that? Obviously, it would involve, it involves legislative change. It's the Irish government has to bring this forward. There's no restrictions from the EU's point of view. Um, but is that something, for instance, that uh, that might fall within uh, within the work that you do? Well, if it, if it was raised as an issue um, with the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission um, within this mechanism, then it, it would have to it would have to sort of trigger the uh, an all the All Ireland dimension. Um, at the moment, it's kind of tricky because if you're if you're living within the constituency of a, of the European Parliament, then my understanding is that you have a, a right to vote in that election. Um, but obviously, post Brexit, the North is no longer within the EU region, so um, that right would probably that right probably wouldn't arise. But there are many um, there are many citizens from other countries who don't reside within the EU. But because they are citizens of that, they are the right holders of that particular member state, uh, and like they are EU right holders, then they have a right to vote uh, Cyprus. Uh, when you look at the north that's under Turkey's control, but you have Cypriot Turks uh, who vote in the European Parliament election. So I just think, Michael, it's an area worth delving into and looking at. 
because we have got some of the laws in Europe applying here and uh, that we should have access to uh, to the European Parliament. And I know there was a time they were talking about observer status. So I, I think, Michael, it's just something that your body uh, should maybe take a look at or maybe you need someone to bring that to your attention in order for you to, for you to do so. It's Sorry, certainly Martina. an issue we can look out for into the future. Martina, yes. Yeah. Martina, can I just add, uh, in support of what Michael has said, that the Equality Commission and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission are actually taking legal advice on this very issue at present. Okay. Um, that has been sought, and we can come back to you with more uh, information on that regard at a future time. Uh, okay. We're still on further details to be provided to us, but we are conscious that some people feel that there is a, a breach or potential breach in that regard. Uh, so we're exploring that at the issue at the minute. Um, I know there have been various pieces of case law in the past in relation to voting, for example, in Gibraltar, um, but it doesn't really stretch to the question that's being asked at present. Um, and we're not aware of any case law that does cover it, that, which is why we're seeking sort of expert guidance in this regard. Okay. From my understanding of it too, there's a rule, the Irish government has to, by it's a pen, it has to change its law um, because it's nothing that is, um, there's no restriction from the EU point of view. We have already done a lot of work uh, on this in the past and have done some, you know, if we have researched it and there's some information, I'm sure you, you are already aware of all of that, but a lot of it comes down to, to the Irish government. Can I ask in relation to children, who are EU citizens, but who live in the south, but go to school in the north, um, and you know how they are being affected by Brexit, because given that the EU protects children's rights to education across member states, but the north is no longer you know, a member of the EU, and then the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights gone. So what's the implications, or are there implications for, uh, for those children? I think maybe Les might be best placed to address this one. Uh, yeah, um, well, Martina, it really depends on <clears throat> the immigration status or uh, that the children and their parents have. So <clears throat> on the assumption that um, if you're an Irish, if you're the if you're a child of an Irish national, well, clearly you've got the common travel area and the protocol <clears throat> makes it clear that the common travel area still applies. If you're a child of a frontier worker and you travel across to school every day, then again, providing um, the application has been made, uh, then you should be um, again um, okay. The question, I suppose, arises if um, you're an EU citizen and you haven't made an application um, and what will happen if somebody eventually discovers that actually you don't have kind of um, uh, status that allows you to travel across the border every day. One of the um, issues that's, that's clearly going to arise is that <clears throat> the UK um, now has is putting into place some very significant kind of um, arrangements in immigration law. They've just issued another immigration document uh, out for consultation around uh, refugees and asylum. Um, I was at a meeting this week in, in the Home Office around uh, arrangements for coming into uh, through ports and through um, um, uh, uh, airports, for example, that EU kind of um, identity cards will no longer apply in, um, in the near future and you will be expected to have a kind of uh, digital kind of card, ID card instead. Well, that's fine, but you're going to have to put some very specific arrangements in place, given that we won't have border controls between um, north, south, south, north. So those kinds of issues, both in policy terms and, and in legal terms, still seem to me to be very much up in the air. So when you talk to government officials, they're very clear that they are cognizant of the uh, the border, but getting out from them what exactly that means in in reality is still still remains to be seen. So that's a very long winded way of saying it's a very much a live issue, not just in terms of crossing the border to go to school every day, 
but in terms of lots of other arrangements. And it's really important that anybody in the EU who lives um, in the south but works in the north, for example, um, make sure that um, that person applies and gets their frontier worker status um, properly um, regulated so that they can actually travel freely. But we still don't know how they're going to manage kind of um, the competing tensions around freedom of movement on the one hand for Irish people, both sides of the border, frontier workers and others who have the right to move. And on the other hand, um, clearly um, arrangements that they want to put in place to um, stop human trafficking, modern slavery, etc. Yeah, Les, when I was listening to you, I couldn't I couldn't work it out in my head, and I probably still can't. That given that the common travel area exists now, we know it's it's built on sand. Uh, we know in terms of the legislative standing, and that may be something that, despite people saying, "Well, it's a comfort, it's air," you know, it's it's operating and it's not going to go away. But in on this instance, like if you're an EU citizen and you're living in Donegal, and you've never had to, why would you apply for settled status? and your child is going to a school in Derry, um, or that you're, you work uh, in Derry, but now you're going to become a frontier worker status uh, applicant. Um, even though then, how does both of those things conflate or, or um, in, in any way are complementary with the common travel area, which we're told sure the common travel area exists? I mean, it just it's it seems that it's all conflating with one another. It's not it's it's not streamlined. It's not aligned here. I I think that's right. I mean, the UK government have said that they are going to base their kind of um, um, border controls and 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 perfectly legitimate issues about um, ensuring that kind of uh, human trafficking doesn't take place and that the um, Northern Ireland doesn't become a route in. Is they're going to base that on? Um, intelligence-based operations and other kinds of arrangements in terms of if you arrive in, in Britain. Um, if that, whether that's going to work or not really does remain to be seen. And, you know, my, my worry, frankly, is when you look back at the terrible events that happened in Essex, the lorry with 39 Vietnamese individuals who all died, um, a number of the people who were prosecuted um, who may not, you know, have been, um, they were part of that chain of exploitation, lived either side and close to the border. So um, there are some really significant issues that we've still to fully interrogate and see how they're going to play out in practice. And just finally, Chair, I'll just ask one question around the common travel area. Um, is there any way that that um, is going to move from the status that it currently has, um, where it hasn't got any legal standing. Um, um, is that going to be required by the Human Rights Equality Commission in order, for instance, to be able to deal with potential breaches that may arise as a consequence of whether it is a child going to school, whether it is cross-border workers, um, frontier worker status, whatever it would be, um, would, will that do you envisage that at any stage being used because it's not nailed down? Um, the, the two governments have been clear that the common travel, common travel, common travel area will continue to apply. We, they've set out um, on social security something a little more firm than that, but we are still dealing with memorandum of, of understanding and other kinds of arrangements. Um, and we commissioned research as a joint committee with the Irish Commission, and it raised the concerns of um, that much of the underpinnings of um, the common travel area in any legal sense were through EU law and freedom of movement, and we don't have those underpinnings to the same extent. So from our point of view as a Human Rights Commission, we would like to see something much more firm and formal um, with legal standing. Um, and both governments know that. Um, I know that there are still kind of discussions around some of the issues around the common travel area, but I'm not aware of anything that's about to be a game changer and, and take the current um, 
arrangements into a much more formal legal footing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all for those answers. Yeah. Mr Chairman, can I maybe just come in on the back of what Les has said? And I know it's very much a peripheral issue, Martina, and it's in relation to racial profiling. And I'm sure you have, um, all of you have been aware of various cases that the Commission have supported over the past number of years where immigration officers <coughs> have um, racially profiled people, not just people travelling through um, airports to leave or arrive in the country, but actually just leaving people off at the airport. Uh, and those settlements have been in the papers um, and got plenty of media coverage at the time. We are concerned about the uh, rising incidents or potential for racial profiling. And um, I just want to reassure you that where we see that there has been some evidence of racial profiling, we will use our powers. Um, we have been calling for the racial equality law to be strengthened in this area, to uh, provide some better protection and greater protection against racial profiling. So I just want to put that on the record that that hasn't gone away. Um, it's still very much there, and we will be keeping a watch and brief on that as well. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in on the back of this? Because I have been raising this issue with TransLink um, in relation to them allowing, um, allowing the, um, the police to come on, the guards to come on their bus, take people off their bus. Um, it's been reported to myself and others that they were being taken off the bus because of the colour of their skin, they believed. Um, and they believed that racial profiling was taking place as a consequence of that. And I have had to and fro uh, conversations and, and meetings with TransLink in relation to um, either saying this not to do with them, if they have to be pulled in, if they're being told that they have to pull in, they have to pull in. But there is something happening with uh, cross-border All-Ireland transport that I think feeds in, Geraldine, to that yeah concern that I particularly share around racial profiling. No, uh, we absolutely agree with you and I'm well aware of uh, a number of examples myself where people have been taken off a TransLink, um, whether it be a bus or train or whatever, to, to go through that process. Um, and the question really falls on, is it TransLink's policy or is it that of uh, immigration or whoever? And, our view would be that it's not TransLink's policy. They don't have a policy of stopping. It's like every other um, bus or any other vehicle. If you're stopped at the border by the guards, you have to pull over. Um, so it's not within their gift to, to deal with that issue. So it's more an issue for immigration. Um, we would um, be keeping that under close uh, observation uh, and would be willing to support people who come forward with details on that regard. But it's not so much an issue for TransLink as it is for those who are conducting their, their investigations. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much. We have only two other members that haven't spoke. I'm just going to check with them, and that's Pat and um, George. Are either of you is wishing to ask any questions here? I'm okay. I'm fine, Okay, that's grand. Thank you very much to both members. Well, look, um, Geraldine, Les, and Michael, thank you very much indeed for your um, presentation uh, here today. Um, you know, it does. It's great to get the the continuity of the quarterly updates from yourselves, just to be able to find out how things are going as they're rolling on. Um, so we look forward to the next update and um, to be able to get some more uh, information as well. And. Um, I think maybe we will, uh, and I'll follow up with members just after, but maybe just find out from the department how they uh, are making sure as the executive office that they're keeping on, uh, on, on the Article 2 requirements as well. And, and if that's useful information to, to send back and forward, we, we can we can keep each other informed of that. But thank you very much for coming along. It's good to see you, Geraldine. Good to see you, Michael. Ian, Carles, sorry, it's good to, to have heard you today. Uh, I remember we give a compliment of saying, you definitely have got a voice that would be great on radio as well. It's very, very good. Very sounds great. But thank you very much for all of you for coming along today. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, members. Goodbye. Thank Thanks, Chair. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Members, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, would members be happy enough if we do that, if we write to the department just to ask them about their uh, how they are monitoring the commitments with regard to the Article 2? Would, would that be okay with members? And we'll see what the feedback is from them. Okay. Um, 
Right, if we, I'll try and rattle as quick as I can through the last bits and pieces, but we've got item 7, which is the SR2021-68 uh, Travel Agents Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulation Northern Ireland 2021. The information is in page 114 to 124 of the meeting pack. The SR came into operation on the 19th of March, uh, and it is subject to negative resolution. Due to the reduction in the statutory period, consequent to additional sitting days during the Easter recess, a decision will have to be taken by the committee next Wednesday at the latest. Um, if members have had an opportunity, I'm hoping that it's maybe relatively straightforward that we may just get agreement here from members today for that statutory regulation. Could I seek the members be happy to, to just give agreement to that? Okay. If, if that's the case, and I'm thinking that it is, as there's no dissent, then um, if I had the right page, I could read out exactly what it is that I've... There we go. Um, then in that case, I can put the following question to the committee, and that is that this committee has considered statutory rule 2021 forward slash 68 and has no objection to the rule. Is that agreed? Agreed. Oh. Great, that's uh, great. Thank you very much for that, members. Item uh, item eight is the forward work program. And just to let members know that on page 130 of the meeting pack, there is a paper outlining the scrutiny and legislative responsibilities that the committee needs to look at. So that will be the things that will be set, uh, that we need to set in stone going forward uh, in the next term. And then at our planning day, we'll be able to plan for the spaces that that leaves around it. But at this stage, are members happy to note the forward work program? Okay. Uh, if you can bear with me, there are quite a number of items of correspondence that require an action. Hope if I rattle through them and we just get agreement, we'll get moving on with them. So um, there are 20 uh, items in the uh, pack and a number in the table pack as well. Um, item 9.1 on page 135 is from the Executive Office in relation to the Shared Prosperity Spot Fund. Uh, I think we've already agreed previously, but can we pass that on to the Finance Committee as well? Great. Great. Uh, item 9.2 on page 142 is a response from the Executive Office on the information regarding the Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition Working Group. Can I suggest that we maybe ask the junior ministers for an oral briefing on that? Okay, our ticket is agreed. Uh, item 9.6 on page 157 is a response from the Minister of Health detailing additional funding to be allocated to the community and voluntary sector, including a number of mental health charities. This query rose from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum presentation. Can I get agreement that we share the response with them? Great. 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 Uh, item 9.7 of page 160 is from the Speaker regarding the commencement of Part 3 of the Public Services Ombudsman Northern Ireland Act 2016, asking that the committee formally agree to take responsibility for the bringing the necessary motion to the Council, or sorry, to the Assembly. Uh, can I get agreement then that we write to the Speaker informing him that the committee will responsibility for bringing the necessary motion to the Assembly. And members will re remember this. We had a presentation from the Ombudsman on this and they have indicated that they would like to develop this work and it's up to them to ask for it, but the Commission can't actually deliver it. It needs a committee of the Assembly. So are we happy enough to take on that role? Yes, great. Okay. Item 9.8 on page 163 is corresponding from the Committee for Finance in relation to the 21-22 budget scrutiny by statutory committees. And it's asking the Committee for the Executive Office to seek evidence from the Executive Office in respect of its expenditure proposals for 21-22 and to respond to the Committee for Finance within the time scale set out in the letter. In order to facilitate that, could I suggest that we write to the Executive Office and ask them to provide us with a written briefing outlining their expenditure proposals for 21-22 and that we get that by the 23rd of April and this will ensure that we're able to consider it and give a response by the 5th of May. Would members be happy enough with that? Great. Great. Item 9.10 on page 169 is from the Committee for the Economy regarding a joint meeting regarding the Executive's COVID recovery plan. Can I seek agreement that the clerk liaise with the clerk of the Committee for the Economy to schedule that joint meeting? 
Great. Okay. Nearly there. Uh, item 9.13 on page 182 is correspondence from the Committee for Justice asking that the Committee for the Executive Office share with them a copy of any information received or that were due to receive in relation to the estimated cost for the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme and the basis on which the costs were calculated, uh, what assumptions were provided to the Government Actuary Department and how the estimated lifespan of up to 80 years the scheme was arrived at. Can I suggest that the departmental responses or briefings that we've received are shared with the Committee for Justice? Okay. And uh, are members content to note the remaining mem uh, remaining correspondence or are there any items that anybody would like to raise? Uh, because I think I've got through most of them there. Um, okay. And then on that basis, uh, item 10, any other business? Then item 11, the date, time and place of the next meeting members will be this day week, Wednesday at 2 o'clock via Starleaf. Can I thank members for their uh, work this afternoon and contributions and wish you all well and see you next week. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.